pleasure for me today to chair again uh, it's the fifth day of our workshop uh, we have again four talks today and one discussion session um, i want to advertise again this lecture journal that we have in case you have questions for the talks but also for uh, the discussion later you can post them there we will have a look and try to um, yeah also address them here in, in zoom and on youtube so um, the first speaker today is uh, Diana Lopez Nasir from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, she's working on cosmology and gravity, and more particularly on the interface between gravitational waves and particle physics. Um, and today she will talk about using pulsars and gravitational wave interferometers to probe ultralight dark matter models. We're happy that you accepted our invitation, and uh, you have 40 minutes. I will give you a five minutes reminder before the end of the talk. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks for inviting me to talk on this topic here. Uh, well, the talk is based on, on work I done with Armaleo, uh, Urban, uh, Blas, uh, and Sibiriakov. Well, from my opinion, uh, the main take home message is that uh, both um, data from pulsar timing and gravitational wave interferometers are useful to prove these kind of models, ultra lighter matter models. Um, this is what I'd like to discuss in, in this talk. Although if uh, the dark matter only interacts through gravity, um, the effects I, I'll focus on um, would be too small, so any measurement of the effects uh, will be challenging. However, uh, it's possible to set a bounds on, internet, uh, on direct captains uh, of dark matter and standard model fields, uh, even with current data. So um, this is the outline. Um, after some motivations, I'll consider models uh, where the matter is ultralight, given by either scalars, uh, vectors, or tensor fields. Then uh, I'll argue why uh, pulsars are useful uh, to prove those models. Um, I'll discuss the two kinds of effects. Uh, one that uh, can be tested observing a set of individual pulsars. And another that is present only uh, for pulsars that are in binary systems. And finally, uh, I'll discuss uh, on the usefulness of gravitational wave interferometers for testing this kind of, uh, this kind of models. So um, the, the main motivations uh, arises, of, of course, from the fact that the success of the standard cosmological model requires uh, the existence of dark contributions and in particular that matter, which remains a mysterious component of our universe. But as, so, as the, standard, uh, the standard paradigm assumes, uh, dark matter will consist of some cold, uh, still undiscovered particles, for which a description in terms of um, a set of non-relativistic particles is appropriate. But uh, there are alternative models. Uh, for instance, dark matter will consist of, um, of very light bosons uh, with high occupation numbers, as I will consider in this talk. Um, the standard candidates are action-like parti action particles uh, and dilatons, uh, but uh, can also be vectors or spin two tensors. So the, the important questions uh, uh, I have in mind here uh, are, to what extent is it possible to discriminate between the the models with different masses, spins, interactions, uh, and where uh, can we look for the imprints uh, of the nature and properties of that matter? So um, let me briefly summarize uh, how that matter is described in these uh, alternative scenarios. So it, since it is uh, very light and the occupation number is large, a sensible description is in terms of a classical field. Uh, in the simplest case, the field can be essentially free uh, and a scalar field. So it satisfies the Klein Gordon equation uh, in a self consistent background metric, uh, cosmological metric. Uh, it, it is assumed that the initial conditions are set during inflation, uh, giving a, a very homogeneous field. Uh, the field is essentially frozen and, and, and behaves as a uh, similar as, as dark energy, uh, after um, the Hubble rate uh, uh, falls below the, the mass of the field. And after that, the WKB approximation is, is reasonable. 
Um, and the homogeneous stress um, tensor corresponds to a perfect fluid with a density uh, at this uh, pressure. So the oscillations in, in the pressure uh, average to zero over cosmological time scale. So it, it, it behaves as a standard matter candidate uh, at the background level. For this field uh, to be the whole of the matter, as I will assume, um, it should start behaving like that, of course, uh, before the epoch of equality, uh, where the hybrid rate is, is about uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 28V. So it should be heavier than, than, than that. Um, but actually, a uh, current CMB and large scale structure data um, on linear scales already constrain the, the mass to be larger than that to the minus uh, 24V. So, um, well, this is for, for a scalar field, but uh, similar dynamics can, can arise for fields with the spin one uh, and two on, on this uh, uh, time scales. Now, um, on shorter scales, in a visualized halo, for instance, one expects uh, that matter uh, to consist of a superpos superposition of random waves, uh, or of waves with random faces. And the superposition produces in a space uh, an interference pattern uh, of wave packets um, with characteristic size of a half a uh, De Broglie wavelength, which can be expressed in this way um, for, for, for these uh, values of, of the velocity and the mass. Inside, inside uh, an individual wave packet, um, the field um, performs coherent oscillations with a, with a period uh, given by 2 pi over m, which can be expressed uh, in this way uh, with the same parameters. Uh, and each coherent part is characterized uh, by, by a local matter density and a velocity, which has a large, uh, say, order one fluctuations between the, the patches. All these expectations are, are borne out by numerical simulations, uh, first done by, by these authors. Um, they show the dark matter distribution in halos has the, this kind of a granular structure characteristic of, of, of wave interference. Now, due to the, the motion of, of the wave packets, um, the field at a given point in space uh, loses coherence uh, after a time that is about half of the De Broglie wavelength over the velocity which also can be expressed in this way using these, these values for the velocity and the mass. Now, so for, for this scenario, um, several observers have been, uh, that are useful to prove uh, different mass ranges have, have been identified. I already mentioned the CMB and large scale structure on linear scales. And on shorter scales, of course, things uh, get more complicated, but still uh, there are uh, different observations that can be used um, both on cosmological and astrophysical scales. There are constraints from uh, Lyman Alpha Forest for the galaxy formation history, uh, the structure, structure of galactic halos, um, pulsar time in array, which I, on which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, and all this, uh, we expect all of this uh, will improve uh, considerably in the future. There are also proposals involving the 21 centimeter line and constraints from black hole physics. In the case of black holes, um, the constraints apply even if the field is not the dark matter. But our goal here was to add uh, more uh, observables to this list, um, both uh, to constrain uh, different mass ranges and to have complementary tests for the same masses. Of course, uh, the robustness of the constraints uh, depend on the observable uh, due to the theoretical and experimental uncertainties, um, assumptions in modeling, and so on. But not that all of these observations uh, can prove a ultra -lighter matter interacting only through gravity. But if the dark matter is dielectric coupled to a standard model fields, um, there are other, other possibilities, uh, of course, model dependent. Um, 
as, as adults uh, using atomic, to, you know, atomic, uh, atomic clocks, uh, accelerometers, uh, resonance mass detectors, and uh, laser and atom interferometry. Yeah. And of course, I'm not to discuss about all of them here. I, I mainly focus on, on, on my work. So um, let me just summarize why uh, are we considering pulsars. So it is because the pulsar um, has a highly stable spin frequency. And as uh, Paulo Freire emphasized in his talk uh, last week, uh, pulsar timing techniques are very precise. So indeed, uh, as, as Paulo showed also in his talk, um, the, the, they are ideal systems uh, to constrain the alternative theories of gravity and the presence of gravitational waves. So our question was, um, are they also useful to, to explore the nature of, of, of dark matter? So to discuss um, this, uh, let me start with the simplest case of a free uh, scalar field. So um, the only effect of the field on the pulsar is due to the gravitational interaction. The stress tensor, uh, act as a source of, uh, of Einstein's equations, producing metric perturbations, uh, which in this case corresponds to, to a scalar uh, gravitational wave. So um, the effect of this scalar wave uh, on, on, on the timing of, of, of individual pulsars uh, was originally uh, um, analyzed by, by these authors. The weight produces a, a time-dependent time delay in the photons arriving on Earth from the pulsars. And there are two main contributions, the so-called Earth term and the pulsar term, uh, which are determined by, uh, by the dark matter field evaluated at the Earth position and at the pulsar position, respectively. The De Broglie, the De Broglie scale uh, can be comparable to or smaller than the distance of, uh, to the pulsar. The, uh, uh, the, it is the, the De Broglie uh, wavelength of the field. Then, uh, when studying cross correlations between different uh, between signals uh, from different pulsars, uh, the contribution of the Earth term uh, dominate. Uh, because uh, the effect of, uh, of the field on the photon path is expected to sum up coherently near the Earth, whereas um, the, the other terms uh, are expected to wash out on, uh, on average. The result is analogous to, to, to that of, of a gravitational wave uh, with, a, with an effective um, strain amplitude given by, by this expression. Um, the, the, the observable is, however, only sensitive to, to very light fields, and the signal um, is uh, weak uh, and decreases as the inverse square of the frequency. Here, um, and also after uh, what follows, I will uh, assume this uh, conservative value for, for the local dark matter density. So the, the, there is, of course, a similar uh, effect for ultralight dark matter with spin one and two. This is for, for the scalar case. The, the spin one case was considered in, in this article. But um, there is a particularity of the spin two case uh, I would like to highlight here. So, um, now for, for the spin two, um, the, the, the self-consistency of the model uh, requires the, existence, the presence of uh, an idiosyncratic interaction between the matter and uh, the standard model fields, which is universal. And this is markedly different in, in spin zero and spin one models, uh, where um, a direct interaction uh, ca can be included but by hand. So in addition to the free action, uh, which uh, includes the usual uh, first Pauli term for a spin two massive field, uh, we have this uh, direct interaction. Uh, for details, uh, you can see this article by Marzola uh, et al. 
So then uh, by, by changing the frame in this way, one can um, define um, an effective metric uh, in terms of um, terms of which the action can be recasted as a free gravitational action. All of these to linear order in the coupling constant. No? We are assuming alpha to be uh, very small. So the effective metric perturbation looks like this. And um, besides the amplitude, it is important to know that the signal now uh, um, has an inverse linear dependence on, uh, on the frequencies rather than inverse quadratic as in the pure gra purely gravitational case. This uh, 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 tensor, this epsilon I, ij, is the polarization tensor. And the pure gravitational effect is uh, roughly um, equivalent to um, having this effective uh, coupling, uh, which has a, a, an additional one over m suppression. Uh, for instance, for a field, uh, for a very light field uh, with mass uh, of order 10 to the minus 23 EV, um, the effective coupling is uh, about uh, 10 to the minus 7. So it's, it's, it's quite small in comparison to, to the constraints I, I will show later. So now, using the, this uh, dominant Earth term contribution in this article, uh, we have uh, um, estimated the limits on alpha. Of course, the, the limits we show in this plot are, are only indicative of what can be done with pulsar time in arrays. These are not uh, precise bounds since uh, we are just comparing a null scale average uh, for, 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 for the amplitude of the, of the, of the, of the signal. We, uh, and, uh, and we are not accounting for, for the specialities of each pulsar. But in this plot, uh, we, reproduce it, the, uh, we reproduce the, the bounds um, on the equivalent uh, gravitational wave strain H as a function of frequency uh, found in, in this article. Now, the blue dotted line uh, corresponds to to a Bayesian analysis uh, done using um, um, data uh, obtained with the Park telescope. And the yellow dash one uh, uh, are also um, bounds uh, obtained from the same uh, using the same data, but with a frequencies analysis. So um, well, these are the, the values of, of, of alpha uh, one can prove uh, with this observable. So notice that the, the signal here decreases as, as, as one of the frequencies now. So we can go to, to lower, uh, to, to higher masses. Uh, different, uh, notice that different um, systematic effects in studies of correlations among pulsar, pulsar pairs, in principle, can be separated. This is thanks to their different anisotropic behavior. For instance, a systematic uh, error in the clock, clock time standard uh, would be monopolar, uh, anisotropic. And a systematic error in the planetary ephemeris, for instance, would be dipolar. But this signal is quadrupolar, so in principle, this uh, can be separated. Okay, so um, this is for, for, for individual pulsars. So let me now discuss uh, on another effect uh, that shows up for, for binary systems. So why uh, binary pulsars are useful? Well, first uh, notice that uh, all these uh, pulsars with the red uh, circle are in binary systems. So they, they have many of the millisecond ones. Uh, let, let's uh, now take, some, take a look at some numbers. So using the, the Kepler's law, we can, we can estimate the size, the typical size of the binary, binary system. Um, typical orbital periods uh, are uh, in the range of hours uh, to a few hundred days. So this is one of the largest distances, sizes, um, 
As for that matter, we can use the typical virial velocity in the halo and consider this mass range. Then um, it's clear that the oscillations uh, can be considered to be coherent and the inhomogeneities can be neglected. This size is much smaller than the Denver wavelength. But uh, can we average over the oscillations? And for the masses in, in this range, in principle, we cannot, uh, since um, there are binary pulsars for which uh, the, the time scale of the orbital motion is of the same order as uh, the quantum time or, or oscillation time of the field. So we are not averaging over the oscillations. And then um, the oscillations in the dark matter field produce a periodic perturbations uh, to the binary pulsar orbits, um, either because the oscillating stress te uh, energy tensor will act as a source of gravity and generate uh, an oscillating curvature, or because um, there is a direct coupling uh, to the stars. So um, the unperturbed orbits ca can be expressed uh, as a Fourier series. Um, so in resonance, um, there is a, that is when the mass of the field uh, is close to one of the harmonics of the Fourier series, there is a secular effect on the orbital parameters. For instance, uh, the, there can be a secular drift of the orbital period or, or on, on the eccentricity. So I, I, as uh, Paolo uh, described, there is a phenomenological timing model uh, that is used to feed data and includes uh, uh, as three parameters, the secular variation of, of orbital parameters. For instance, uh, these are some of the uh, orbital parameters and their secular variation for Hulse-Taylor. Um, to, to place constraints, what we, we have done was to took, um, we took the, um, the observed value or for the orbital period change, and we subtracted all uh, non kinematic effects, the, uh, those uh, due to the, the, the galactic potential, differential galactic uh, rotation, uh, one that is called Shukovsky effect, uh, and, and also the change uh, due to the, the, the gravitational wave dumping. After subtracting this, what remains uh, uh, can be used to constrain our effect. So um, uh, let me focus first on the case uh, ultralight dark matter interacts only through gravity. So the magnitude of the effect uh, can, be, uh, can be seen in this plot. Um, solid lines corresponds to n equal one. Uh, and, and dash line, lines uh, to n equal two. The corresponding orbital periods are shown in, in, on the top axis. Um, note that the, it uh, decreases with the eccentricity of the system. And as, as can be expected from, from, from symmetry arguments, it, it, uh, this effect will, it will vanish uh, for circular orbits. Of course, uh, the effect increases uh, with the local dark value for the dark matter density. So um, a way of improving the sensitivity is to look for binary systems in denser dark matter environments, say, say, say closer to the galactic center, uh, where for instance, we can have uh, this value of, of, for the dark matter density. Um, well, um, we notice uh, that the magnitude of the effect for resonances with n equal one uh, are comparable with uh, the one uh, from higher for higher harmonics in, in, here in the plot n equal two, but also for higher harmonics. So in principle, a single eccentric binary can prove uh, several different masses. Um, sorry. Okay, so um, we see the effect uh, is more important for, for slow uh, non-relativistic systems. So uh, detecting this 
PV dot induced by, by this pure gravitational interaction will be challenging. It, it will require, uh, it will require a, 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 the accuracy of at least uh, an accuracy of at least 10 to the minus 16 in the determination of, of this quantity of PV dot uh, for non-relativistic systems. And currently, as also as Paolo said, uh, such precision has been achieved uh, in the timing of the double pulsar, but, but the orbital period of, of, of the double pulsar is too, too short to be sensitive to this effect. So now uh, let me present some results for model with direct interactions. I'll start with the scalar case. Uh, the simplest case, which is uh, which has an universal dilaton-like uh, coupling. So this coupling uh, respects the weak equivalence principle, but still the, this violates the, the strong equivalence principle with the non-universal non effective couplings uh, being generated for, for object, objects with a large uh, gravitational self-energy. So the effective mass of a, of a, of a member uh, of, of the binary will uh, become field dependent and, and the effective coefficients, uh, uh, coefficient will, will depend on, on, its, on, the binding, on its binding energy. The two bodies in, in a binary system uh, typically have a 10% difference uh, in, in, in their sensitivity. Then uh, there will be an effect that is analogous to that discussed by Paulo Freire uh, uh, due to the dipolar emission, as well as other effects uh, we, have also, we have discussed in this article that are proportional to delta alpha, so the difference between the sensitivities of the binary members. But here, for simplicity, I, I, as is, we can have an effect uh, even if delta alpha is zero. I will, I will just ignore any non-universality of, of the coupling and, and present only one example for, 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 for one system. Um, if you are interested on, on other kind of uh, effects, so you can please take a look at the paper or, or, or you can ask me later. And in this case, uh, the um, by symmetry arguments, because uh, the, there is no asymmetry in, in the coupling, it is necessary to use uh, eccentric binaries. So, for instance, uh, sorry. So, for instance, taking the, the bounds um, on the secular drift uh, of, of the orbital period, obtained for uh, analyzing data for this system, assuming the, the field is close to resonance, we obtain this plot. The values of alpha. Um, above, above the, the, the gray region uh, can be excluded with current data, with these error bars. Uh, the, the blue area uh, assumes an error uh, on PV dot of order 10 to the minus 13. So this, uh, these bounds uh, are expected to be competitive or compa uh, complementary uh, to, with solar system uh, bounds planetary bounds about this level. And, well, notice that uh, um, the spectral sensitivity to alpha decreases very fast uh, as the masses uh, depart from the resonant values. So uh, the, uh, the system is sensitive to ultralighter matter only in a few uh, narrow resonant bands. I will skip the, the, the details for, for scalars and vectors. If you are interested, uh, please ask, ask me later or, or take a look at, at, at our papers on that. Uh, and maybe you, you have already heard about uh, that in, in, previ in previous talks by me or one of my co-authors. Uh, so here I, 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 I like to focus on, on what I have done more recently, which has to do with the spin two case. Um, and I will just show one plot uh, for the case of the universally coupled spin two that matter, which combines all the all the different constraints uh, on the coupling alpha. 
uh, here. Uh, each point corresponds to these narrow resonant bands. This, uh, to, to each point corresponds to a binary system and assumes it is in resonance. The dark symbols uh, uh, are for the actual precision, the current precision, uh, and, and the light ones assume a precision uh, that is a factor of 10 better, uh, which is more or less uh, realistic for, for some systems. Uh, for, for lighter fields, we have the constraints uh, um, obtained from pulsar time array data, which are complementary. Uh, to that from binaries. And uh, we also show the constraints from Cassini spacecraft data, data uh, and from the motion of planets. Of course, uh, to, to make this plot, <laughs> we have many, many simplifying assumptions, um, but this is just an illustration um, of the constraints that, that can be set uh, using pulsars and the complementary uh, with other observables. Now, uh, so let me briefly discuss another kind of experiments that can be, that we think um, are useful to prove uh, this kind of models too. And these are gravitational wave interferometers. So, um, as you know, um, using gravitational wave interferometers, there have been many detections of tra transient events, such as uh, the coalescences of binary black holes, uh, with a gravitational strain amplitude of order 10 to the minus uh, 21. The events last uh, from a fraction of seconds uh, to several seconds, but uh, much weaker signals could, could be detected if they are coherent over longer times, uh, such as continuous gravitational waves uh, emitted uh, by rapidly spinning neutron stars, for instance. And currently, um, there are upper limits uh, on the maximum strain uh, for continuous gravitational waves. For instance, a bound uh, that is three orders of magnitude smaller, uh, is 10 to the minus 20, 25, can be set uh, for, free, for a frequency of order 10 to the two hertz. And future facilities will both uh, improve the limits on the maximum strain amplitude and extend the frequency range. So now uh, ultra lighter matter can affect uh, gravitational wave interferometers both because it is, uh, its energy and pressure change the space star curvature, uh, but this effect is, however, too small to, to be detected as, as this, author, this author consider. And indeed, uh, this is uh, small, not, not only because uh, the gravitational interaction is weak, but also because uh, the signal decreases as one of the uh, of the one over the frequency square. So it has a very small amplitude for, for the frequencies relevant for gravita to gravitational wave interferometers. But um, ultra lighter matter can affect gravitational wave interferometers also if it is directly coupled to ordinary matter. Then uh, one can constrain the coupling. Uh, for, for, the, for, for the dark matter, velocity of order 10 to the minus 3, um, the coherence time of, of, of is about um, 10 to the 6 oscillation periods, that is 10 to the 6 over the frequency. So one can see that uh, it does not remain coherent uh, over the time of, of, the observation, of the observation campaign of the gravitational wave interferometers. However, there are um, semi-coherence techniques uh, to analyze continuous waves that can be adapted and optimized um, to take into account the coherence time of the ultra lighter matter field. And this, is, uh, uh, this has been done already for the spin one case in this paper. So to sketch uh, the relevance of, of this kind of analysis, 
Here I am presenting this plot um, for the case of uh, ultra lighter matter is a spin to field. The other one is five, yeah, five more minutes left. You have five yes, minutes. Yes, I'm finishing. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Um, so this is a, this plot is for the case uh, that matter is spin to field with the direct interaction alpha. So the, the, in the plot, we compare um, this expected theoretical signal age with the um, design sensitivities for transient events um, of a number of current uh, the current and planned uh, gravitational wave interferometers. Uh, we have also drawn um, the bounds uh, coming from experiment searching uh, fifth forces. In particular, in red, in red we have HLB, uh, which corresponds to the existing Earth-based facilities, advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo. Um, we expect that the a dedicated semi-coherent search for the spin two case will improve um, the range of detectable alpha by a few orders of magnitude. Uh, and this is shown in this plot uh, with this uh, dotted HLB opt, which uh, 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 we're taking into account this uh, semi-coherent uh, analysis of data. Uh, finally, uh, plan uh, facilities such as uh, LICE and DECIGO and DBO would uh, extend this uh, the frequency range uh, to masses up to 10 to the minus 19 EV. So uh, that's all. So let me conclude. So ultralighter matter uh, can uh, produce a uh, potentially observable effects uh, on pulsar uh, and gravitational wave interferometers because it is uh, its energy and pressure change um, the space time um, geometry, or if it is uh, directly coupled to ordinary matter. Precise uh, timing measurements uh, are already ongoing for many pulsars. Uh, even binary pulsar is sensitive to ultralighter matter um, only in a few narrower bands. And we expect uh, of order 10 to the 3 binary pulsars to be discovered uh, by SKA, so one can expect it to have a significant coverage. Um, pulsar timing array is uh, sensitive to lighter fields and can provide complementary bounds. Uh, to take advantage uh, of the large numbers of systems, it is necessary to develop a, a new statistical approaches and techniques for this, for the extraction of uh, of the constraints on, on ultra lighter matter fields, and um, gravitational wave interferometers are also useful to prove uh, direct interactions between uh, dark matter, ultra lighter matter, and, and standard model fields, providing complementary bounds um, for for heavier fields. Both uh, for pulsar and gravitational wave interferometers it would be worth uh, performing a dedicated data analysis. So thanks a lot for, for your attention. OK, well, thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, we have time for questions, either here or um, on the Slack. Um, you can raise your arm here or just, OK, I see Costas has a question already. Go ahead. Question is just applauding. Ah, OK, sorry. I was Yes. I can ask a question while the others think it's sure. Go ahead. I, I think I've asked this question to Diana already, but I don't remember the answer. Um, so, yeah, you, you consider this direct coupling uh, and the impact on binary pulsars. If I have this direct coupling between the dark matter and the single um, millisecond pulsar, um, it will also change the moment of inertia, I imagine, of the, on the mass of the star. So does it have an impact on the, not only on binary systems, but also on the structure of the star and therefore on the spin down, on the, um, on the rotation of a single millisecond pulsar? And if so, can you use it to constrain these models? I, I don't know if I formulated the question in a clear way. So 
do you, yeah. think, you, you see what I mean? Or if I, yeah, I think you're talking about the fact we already discussed about that. Yeah, I think I've already, ago, yeah. already discussed, I think long ago, but I don't remember why we, if, uh, if we so, conclude. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, uh, trying to, to estimate the, the, this effect, I remember, with, uh, also with Diego. I don't know if Diego is there. Um, but then in the end, I don't remember whether we concluded it's small and if it is small, why? Because it's similar to the, this effect that you have on the, in the galaxy, right? You have this ball oscillating, so... It, there is a different scale. It's a different mass uh, which would uh, be interesting. Well, we need a, uh, wait, uh, a, a larger mass to, to resonate with the structure of the... Yeah. Okay. I see. So maybe that's the reason. Okay, the analysis is suppressed. Yeah, I see. Okay. Okay, Paolo. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a quick question about spin to field dark matter. Uh, so mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, asking to particle physicists, they are a bit uh, skeptical on spin to dark matter, probably because they don't know any, um, say, fundamental model in which this can emerge, while they are happy working with spin zero and spin one. So do you think that this is fair or I mean, is there any, I don't know, fundamental dark matter model that uh, provides uh, spin two fields naturally? No, I know, I know, this is something I, yeah. Uh, this is something to discuss. <laughs> Here exactly. <laughs> I'm not an expert on, on this uh, connection, but uh, yeah. Question. In principle, Sorry, but can but you, you can place the same constraints with gravitational wave interferometers for spin zero and spin one, right? Or was there a reason why you consider spin two especially? I mean, maybe that's the same question, Paolo. Um, no, I was not actually, I mean, I'm particularly in favor of spin two models. I, I was just curious why, uh, from the particle physics point of view, there seems to be less interest compared to spin one and spin zero. And I, my guess is that because there are models in which, I don't know, dark photons emerge uh, more naturally than uh, dark gravitons, so to speak. But I'm not sure. I mean, yes. I would ask the same question as today, so it's, <laughs> yeah, cannot answer that. Okay. Um, if you have more questions, just put them on the Slack. Um, I think we should go on. Thanks again for the talk and being here for the questions. Um, our next speaker is Kostas Klambedakis. You can try to share your screen. Okay. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Hi, um, let me briefly introduce you first. So, uh, okay, uh, Kostas Kompadakis yes, uh, is from the University of Murcia in Spain. And yeah, his research is on compact objects, um, neutron stars, black holes, and also more exotic things. And today he will talk about uh, black hole quasi normal modes and shadows. Uh, if you want to have more time for questions, I can give you the five minutes falling after 30 minutes, otherwise, um, as usual. Okay, thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, thank you very I would like, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's been an exciting workshop all these days. Uh, so my talk is basically consists of two parts. Uh, part devoted on shadows and test of gravity using shadows. And the second part is about cosmal modes of black holes beyond ZR. Um, so kicking off with the first part, this is based on a, on a recent paper with uh, by myself and George Papas, who is somewhere there hidden in the audience. And this is about testing gravity with supermassive black holes. It's actually a question mark here. Um, well, there is, let me begin with this slide. There is some poetic beauty in the fact that there is exactly one century separating these two milestone events uh, in gravitational physics. We are, of course, very uh, we are all aware of the 1919 Eddington Dyson uh, solar eclipse expedition, the first measurement of light deflection by the sun. This is when Einstein became famous in the aftermath of these of these measurements. 
And then a hundred years uh, after that, in 2019, we had this spectacular remote by, uh, released by the Event Horizon uh, collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. This is the image and the shadow of the supermassive black hole at the center of M87 galaxy. It's a giant elliptical galaxy. Uh, so this shadow to, well, to uh, leading order can be associated with the presence of a black hole, of a photon ring in the space time of a black hole, but in reality also represents uh, uh, extreme deflection of light, more extreme than this system here. So here we have deflection of light by the sun, and here we have extreme uh, deflection of light by black hole. So this is my historical background slide. Let's move to uh, business. <laughs> Uh, so this uh, this is a very uh, very short summary of the properties of the M87 uh, black hole. The mass is around six billion solar masses. This has been estimated with two methods. Uh, the first method is from the from the observation of the of the shadow itself, knowing the the angular size and the distance, which is roughly 18 megaparsec. We can solve the relay the uh, the leading order relations for the mass and um, use a number like this. And then the second method, which also leads to this number, is by studying the kinematics of the, of the stellar population in the vicinity of this black hole. What is less uh, known is the, the care spin parameter of the system. So I didn't put any number here because uh, if you look up, uh, if you have a look at the relevant literature, you, will, you know, you will see that there is not really uh, some true constraint. So the spin is unknown in the system. The other thing we know about the M87 black hole is you know something about the accretion flow. And this is, we have learned this with the help of uh, all these numerous GRMSD uh, simulations, which came together with the, the publication of the shadow. So the, uh, the accretion flow is something like something between quasi-spherical to thick disk. Uh, theoretical modeling observations do not favor, uh, for example, thin disk uh, accretion flow. So this will become important in, uh, in the error I will discuss later, in the error related to the, to the radius of the shadow, how this is affected by uh, the geometry of the accretion flow. So uh, there was a re recent paper by the Event Horizon collaboration. This is, this is the paper by Chaldes et al. It was a PRL that was published in last September, October. Uh, so the, the logic in that paper was to use the shadow radius uh, to constrain any deviations from GR. So in that paper, the authors used uh, this metric by, published by Johansson in 2013. It's called the Johansson metric. So this is a nice, uh, parameterized deformation of the care space time. In addition to that, it's separable with respect to the, to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. It has all these nice care properties, but it is not care uh, uh, unless the deformation parameters are exactly zero. Uh, so in this talk, as it was also assumed for most part of this paper, we will ignore the black hole spin. Um, why? Because the, the shadow is quasi-circular. In, in the care space time, the shadow is quasi-circular almost for the entire uh, spin range. Only if the black hole is very close to extreme, then uh, you can see deviations from uh, circularity. So assuming for the moment an exactly uh, a non-rotating black hole in a circular orbit and a circular shadow, I'm sorry, uh, the radius is, can be calculated from these relations here. The radius is the impact parameter associated with the photon ring. Uh, so here it depends on the on the radius of the photo ring and the GTT metric component evaluated at the same radius and the photo ring radius can be calculated from this relation here. As you can see, the only metric component relevant to this calculation is just GTT. And for the Johansson metric with no spin, this GTT is a function of R and is given by this relation down here. Uh, there are two deformation parameters entering uh, this function is the epsilon three and alpha one three. In the GR limit, these are both zero, and we just recover the well-known Schwarzschild GTD metric component. Right. Let me move to the next slide. Uh, so this is a figure taken from the Psalpis et al. Uh, twenty-two paper. It shows uh, 
one of the deviation parameters, this alpha 1, 3, as a function of the, of the spin of the, of the black hole, of the M87 black hole. Uh, the two dust lines here correspond to the published 17% error of the, of the radius relative to the GR prediction for uh, the radius of a shadow, assuming a non-rotating black hole. And this is a very well-known number for any practitioner of general relativity. It's three times root three times M. I'm using relativistic units. So this is something like roughly 5.2. So you add and you subtract 70%. And basically, you find yourself in this range here. And as they did in that paper, assume that the second deformation parameter, epsilon 3, is 0, for simplicity. So this is the constraints, the bounds we, uh, they found for alpha 1 and 3. And as you can see, as you spin up the black hole, as a result of the quasi-circular shadow, these constraints they don't vary too much. So much of the discussion uh, was basically could be built uh, assuming non-rotating system, a rotating system. Uh, so these are the bounds assuming only one non-zero deformation parameter. If you were to switch on all of them, or the two of them in the present problem, then per parameter, the bounds become weaker. What you actually bound is a combination of the uh, of the two. Now, however, this kind of tests of uh, non-GR gravity, or if you like deviations from GR, they come with some caveats that could be potentially serious. Uh, one of them is related to the matter degree of freedom, and it has to do with uh, the uncertainty in the geometry of the illuminating accretion flow. This is something pointed out in this recent paper by Grala, which was published after the Event Horizon Telescope paper. The second caveat, which is the, the serious one, has to do with the gravitational, the gravity degree of freedom, and the impact of uh, the presence of dimensional constants in, in the action of a, a given non-GR theory. And I, I'm gonna spend uh, most of my time discussing this. But first, let's, uh, let's spend five minutes on this. Um, so uh, the content of this slide is very similar to what we saw in a talk uh, last week by Avery Broderick. Probably he is in the audience. Hope so. <laughs> uh, so I've taken these figures and the, the, and the results from an earlier paper by Grala and collaborators. This is a paper from 2019. The fact is that what the apparent, the apparent radius of a shadow uh, is not exactly determined by the photon ring radius. Uh, it does depend also on, on the geometry of the illuminating accretion flow. So as you vary this geometry from something quasi-spherical to thin disk, uh, to a thin disk configuration, uh, the radius varies uh, accordingly. So for instance, if we consider this unrealistic example, this has nothing to do with M87. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a backlit black hole. So basically there is a illuminating plane uh, located at, at infinity. Uh, so the black hole is illuminated from behind. Uh, so in this figure here, we can see two features. There is a very faint ring which, with radius, the true uh, impact parameter uh, associated with, with the space-time's uh, photon ring. We are assuming a short child space-time here. This is a short child black hole. But to leading order, the apparent size of the, of the shadow, it's, it's a number, it's an impact parameter, it's a radius uh, slightly larger, 6.2. This is what uh, the calculation of Gran et al. suggests. So if you want to relate this to the actual geodesics of photons, the 6.2 uh, impact parameter corresponds to photons coming from infinity and are deflected by the gravitational field of the black hole by 90 degrees. So they correspond to the boundary of the orange trajectories, while the 5.2 uh, impact parameter radius corresponds to, to the last orbit that is not captured by the black hole. So that's, uh, this is exactly the impact parameter corresponding to the true photon ring. Um, so, uh, Based on these results by the Graal et al. paper, and forgetting about thin disks, considering only the, the range between quasi-spherical accretion to thick disks, one can glean the following information, that the, the radius of the apparent shadow ranges between the, the value 5.2 associated with the photon ring to, to a slightly larger value, uh, 5.8. Uh, so, uh, we replot the figures. We uh, we have I have here a, a figure similar to the one in the Charles et al. paper. 
uh, this is from our paper with, with George. So this is, we plot the impact parameter as a function of deformation parameters. Uh, this dust line, the, the, the middle dust line corresponds to the, to the GR result, 5.2, and, and the upper and the lower dust lines correspond to the 70% error. So adding this range here as a gray, uh, as a gray stripe, we can see that basically covers most of the portion of the figure above the general deviistic value. The, the curves here, the, the blue curve corresponds to the deformation parameter alpha 1, 3 when the second parameter is zero, while the orange curve corresponds to the second deformation parameter epsilon 3 when the first is set to zero. And as a demonstration, there is also a curve, the, the, the green dust curve, that corresponds to a, a simple relation between the two. Uh, an interesting fact is that the two deformation parameters in this Johansson metric are anti-correlated. Uh, while the one reduces the, the shadow radius, the other increases the shadow radius. Uh, so this gray zone basically overlaps with the 17% error reported in the, in the measurement of the shadow radius. So to some extent, uh, this error due to the unknown accretion physics, it's, it's already there in the 70% error. Uh, because uh, the 70% error includes the results of, of, a, new, of a large number of GRMHD simulations. Uh, what is important from this figure is that the portion be, uh, below the general relativistic value remains unaffected. So I would say that this is much better for testing any deviations from GR. So this is the region I'm talking about. This is the, this is the clean region for testing uh, GR. It remains unaffected by uh, the uncertainty in the, accretion, uh, in the accretion physics. So now moving to the second caveat, it has to do with the, the gravity degrees of freedom. Uh, let's consider for this talk a Lagrangian interaction of this general form. There is the GR part here plus a scalar field part, and there is the coupling term, which is the, the true non-GR degrees of freedom. There is a coupling constant, there is a, there is a function of the scalar field, and there is a function of uh, nonlinear derivatives. These are the curvature terms. And then at the very end, we can add the Lagrangian that describes the matter of the system. What is important here that this alpha, as a result of these terms, should have a dimensionality of length to some power n, where n can be greater or equal to 1. Or in relativistic units, this is mass to the power of n. So the typical example of, uh, of an action of this family is the action of the Einstein uh, scalar gauss bonnet gravity. I will just call it gauss bonnet because this is a mouthful. And I'm not going to call it ESGB. That's another mouthful. So this is the action of gauss bonnet theory. The, the alpha parameter has the dimensionality of length squared because uh, the gauss bonnet curvature invariant has the dimensionality of uh, 1 over length squared. And the f function is dimensionless to some extent is user specified and is of order unity. So we're going to consider this uh, this particular theory as a representative member of this more general class of theories. So uh, with this with this theory, first of all, we want to make contact with bounds coming from gravitational uh, gravitational wave signals detected by LIGO. These are signals from uh, merging black holes. So this the, the signal, the gravitational waves, among other things, they probe the celestial mechanics of the binary in the last few in the last few orbits. Uh, so just to have an idea of what the space-time metric of a black hole in this theory looks like, I've taken this formula from the Julie Berti paper of 2019. So I just, I'm showing here only GTT. So this is the GR part. This is an, ex this is an expansion in the coupling, in a dimensionless coupling parameter, which is this. Uh, it's alpha divided by m squared. So it has become dimensionless, uh, multiplied by the derivative of this f function evaluated at some asymptotic scalar field. So this is a post internal expansion as, and, uh, and at the same time, it's an expansion in, in the coupling constant. So even by looking at this simple formula here, you can see, you can see that any n uh, greater than one will mean that you have uh, strong deviations from the space time of a, of a short side black hole. And as a result, deviations from the expected general relativistic uh, celestial mechanics just before a merger of a black hole. Uh, 
So there are actually bounds, actual bounds from the LIGO Virgo observations. Uh, you can find details in those two papers, the recent. There is one by Nair et al, 2019, and the more recent one with more experiments taken into account by Clifton et al. Uh, this figure is, uh, this fi I took this figure from the first paper. So the bounds basically uh, say that uh, the square root of alpha, which has dimensionality of length, it cannot exceed a uh, few kilometers. This is for a typical uh, LIGO uh, binary black hole system with a typical mass of 100 solar masses. So uh, translating this to this dimensionless uh, combination, this translates to something that cannot exceed uh, a number of order unity. So these are, this is what gravitational wave astronomy tells us for a theory like uh, gauss bonnet gravity. Okay, so far so good. And then now I assume we're going to test exactly the same gravity, the same theory of gravity, gauss bonnet using the shadow of the M87 uh, black hole. What is important here uh, is that the shadow is an experiment, it's a geodesic experiment. Both the matter orbiting the black hole and the photons detected by the instrument or the, the constellation of telescopes on Earth uh, are following geodesics of the, of the supermassive of the supermassive black hole. Uh, so we can write schematically that uh, any geodesic in, in, a, in a black hole, in the gauss bonnet black hole, minus uh, the, the same geodesic in a, in a GR, in the corresponding GR space-time, the difference between those two, they have to be of order, to leading order, of order of this dimensionless uh, combination. All right. Uh, now in this, in this gauss bonnet theory, this alpha is a universal constant like G. Right, so once has to be constrained by one experiment like LIGO, the same number has to be true in any other, uh, in any other physical system. So, however, the, geodes the geodesics depend on eta. So let's calculate eta for M87. It will be, roughly speaking, up to a numerical factor of order unity, the same alpha divided by the square, by the square of the mass of the M87 black hole. So we can, uh, we can rewrite this in terms of the eta of the binary system of the LIGO Virgo binary system. But then if, uh, if we do this, then we also have this uh, ratio depending on the mass of the mass ratio between the systems, the binary system divided by the mass of the supermassive black hole square. So putting the numbers here, we obtain a number which is 10 to the minus 14. So the dimensionless eta parameter uh, uh, appearing in the geodesics of, of a black hole uh, in gauss bonnet gravity, for the case of the, of the supermassive black hole like M87, cannot exceed uh, the number 10 to the minus 14. So it's time. So what's the conclusion here? That uh, any geodesic experiment uh, around a supermassive black hole like M87 basically virtually sees uh, a care space time to a precision of one part in 10 to the 14. It's virtually, for it, to every part practical purpose, the space time is care. So the test would seem to fail. The test of uh, probing for the basis from GR, it, it should fail. The, the black hole space time should be indistinguishable from care. So the same argument has been pointed out in a different, in a different context, still supermassive black holes, but not shadows, but extreme mass ratio in spirals. Uh, these are sources for LISA. So this argument was this uh, this argument was discussed in this recent paper by Marcelli et al. Of course, LISA has has an advantage because it does not only probe geodesics, it does not only probe celestial mechanics, it only probes the the radiative back reaction on an orbiting uh, test body around the supermassive black hole. So things may be diff slightly different for LISA, and at the same at the same time, LISA will uh, probe will actually see. Uh, 10 to the five cycles during the spiral. It's not a snapshot of a, of a system. It's actually monitoring its long-term evolution in terms of celestial mechanics. So these are, uh, these are the implications for shadow-based tests of GR. Uh, so supermassive black hole shadows cannot test non-GR theories in the following cases. This the first case is a trivial one. They are theories that admit the care metric the known care metric as an exact solution. In that case, there is nothing to test. The space time is care, and so the ge geodesics cannot say anything about deviations from care. The second uh, possibility is the one I've just discussed. Uh, there is a non care space time in a non GR uh, 
theory of gravity, but there are dimensional, there are dimensional coupling constants. And combining this with constraints from LIGO, then these are mass, they are mass suppressed. If, if uh, you were to, to apply the same, uh, if you were to apply the same theory to a supermassive black hole. So uh, in this class, the, the majority of theories considered the literature actually uh, fall into this class, the theories with dimensional coupling constants. Now, uh, on the opposite side of, <laughs> uh, on the opposite side, there are, so, uh, we can ask when supermassive black holes can test non-GL theories. Well, the first case is when the theory has dimensionless coupling constants. So the, then you can equally well apply to solar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. The dimensionless constants will be the same in both cases. Uh, so a member of this class, which, comes, which could be called the minority class, is Einstein ether gravity. Now there is another, uh, there is another possibility here, and it has to do with theories with dimensional coupling constants. So the, the shadow test could still be valid if somehow uh, we could evade the bounds coming from gravitational wave observations. And there are two possibilities for that. These are discussed in the following slides. Uh, the first mechanism is uh, screening. Uh, this audience is very, is very familiar with this mechanism. It's actually also a trick uh, commonly used in cosmology for evading solar system uh, tests and any other bounds coming from compact uh, binary objects. Uh, so there are two possibilities here, either either there is a modification in the matter part of the Lagrangian. This would be relevant for black holes, given that they are vacuum solutions, unless we are talking about screening an entire galaxy and the black hole uh, within the galaxy. The, the, the screening mechanism that is more relevant to this discussion here is the one uh, affecting this part of the Lagrangian. So we forget about the, Lagran the, the matter part of the Lagrangian. We are focusing on the non-zero part of the Lagrangian. Uh, so this is this screening mechanism is achieved by adding higher order derivatives. Uh, the Weinstein mechanism is the most the most common uh, example of this of this procedure. In this case, yes, theoretically speaking, of course you you can you can screen solar mass black holes and leave unscreened uh, supermassive black holes. So uh, as I said, this audience is very familiar with screening. If uh, but I, let me just mention for, for the sake of it that when I say screening is that uh, there is a length scale associated with the screening physics below which uh, any non-zero degrees of freedom are suppressed. This is what uh, screening really means. Anyway, so in, the, uh, in this case here I was discussing, uh, it, is, it is feasible that, uh, is this conceivable that uh, solar mass black holes could be screened and then LIGO actually sees uh, uh, a GR black hole space time, but uh, the, same, the same may not be true for supermassive black holes. This may, may be left unscreened. However, this looks like a fine tuning situation. Okay, it is possible, but it's not the generic scenario. Now moving to the second mechanism, how the second wave uh, for evading uh, the LIGO gravitational wave bounds. This has to do with scalarization, spin-induced scalarization. Uh, so what happens here? Uh, uh, the Kerr metric can be can be an, an accepted solution of a, of a non of a non ZR uh, theory of gravity. But then, as the as the black hole spins up, at some point it undergoes a dynamical stability. This is what we call a spontaneous scalarization. And uh, beyond that spin threshold. The black hole becomes non care It acquires scalar hair, scalar charge, and basically violates the non care theorem. So this is what happens, for instance, in the case of Gauss-Bolnay gravity. Uh, so there were two recent papers, both published in 2021, both PRLs. The one by the first one by Berkeley et al. and the second one by Cerdeiro et al. There was also some previous work uh, on the subject, uh, on the subject of spin-induced scalarization. So what what these two recent works found that uh, in this particular uh, in this particular theory of gravity uh, scalarization occurs takes place above a spin threshold of 0.5 m in terms of the Kerr parameter, and uh, one also needs negative uh, coupling constants. So in terms of this dimensionless ratio I showed before, this has to be uh, something between 
minus 0.1 and minus 10. So this summarized in this figure here, this is taken, I think, from, from the first paper, from this one. Uh, so this is the, the parameter space of the of the sp of spontaneous colorization is based is this wet like uh, region here. Uh, so this is this is the in the horizontal we have the coupling constant is negative, and in the vertical we have the care parameter of the black hole. So for instance, the idea here is that uh, LIGO black holes uh, probe spins up to 0.7 roughly. So you could say that. Uh, what LIGO sees are non-scalarized black holes, that is, uh, Kerr black holes in this particular theory, while uh, a supermassive black hole like M87 could very easily be uh, rapidly rotating, could be up here, and could be scalarized. And then a shadow test could probe the, the, scalarized, the scalarized properties of, of the supermassive black holes. So this one, uh, the second wave uh, of evading uh, the rest of the gravitational wave bounds. However, even if you look at this figure here, uh, the parameter space where spin and induced scalarization occurs, it's uh, it's a small fraction of the of, of the entire spin coupling constant parameter space. So, from that point of view, also this mechanism seems to be uh, the exception to the rule rather than the generic scenario. So uh, I would like to wrap up the first part of my talk. These are the conclusions. So uh, given, given existing gravitational wave bounds and the presence of dimensional coupling constants uh, in non-zero theories, then black hole shadow, black hole shadow based tests uh, are expected to be blind to this part, to this kind of, uh, to this kind of theories. There is no problem whatsoever if you want to probe theories with dimensionless uh, constants in the, in the action. Uh, exceptions to the, to the first bullet point is uh, the two mechanisms I, I mentioned, screening or spin scalarization. But I, as, I, I, I would like to repeat that these are, they appear to be exceptions in the rule, not a generic uh, scenario. Uh, what about the uncertainty due to the matter degree of freedom? Yes, this this affects the this affects any test of uh, of GR gravity, but only to a moderate degree. In particular, the portion of uh, of B below the general relativistic B may not be affected. So uh, the results discussed here this will have similar implications for other geodesic based experiments, experiments designed to test. Uh, to probe for deviations for from GR, namely any astrometry test of GR around our galactic supermassive black hole, the Sagittarius A star. Uh, this is the this is the purpose of the of the gravity experiment, or observations, electromagnetic observations of accretion flows uh, around active galactic nuclei. Also, that experiment is based on matter uh, orbiting a black hole geodesically or quasi-geodesically uh, orbiting a black hole and emitting photons that follow uh, geodesics in the, in the big black hole space-time. So moving to the second part of the talk, this is based on some recent papers by myself and collaborators. This is Hector Silva, presently at the Albert Einstein Institute uh, in Berlin. Uh, the results I'm gonna, show here, I'm gonna show you here is from this paper, which is in preparation, will appear very soon by Albert Bryant and Ken Yagi at the, at the University of Virginia, uh, Hector Silva and myself. So this is, these are on the subject of cosmological modes uh, of non-GR black holes. So the context here is black hole ring down and spectroscopy. Uh, um, we are all familiar with this cartoon. Well, we also have the, the real <laughs> the real waveform. Well, so we have. Uh, Emerging black, a binary black hole system, have the spiral part of the waveform, the merger, and then the ring down. Uh, so here I'm going to focus on the ring down part of, of the signal. What is important here are uh, these frequencies. Let's the atomic lines of this method of this spectroscopic method of this spectroscopic method. But the quasi normal mode frequencies of the black hole. There's a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, so there is a fundamental uh, frequency, first overton, etc. And 
in the case of general relativity, uh, they all depend only on two numbers, the mass and the spin, for a given multiple, for a given angular multiple. So this is a manifestation of the Noether theorem. So if, uh, uh, if your instrument is able to extract two, at least two frequencies, then uh, we can reverse this, this formula, um, measure mass in the spin, and then the third frequency can serve as a consistency check. It can, it can serve as a test of uh, the Kerr metric. So uh, how about doing this, how about extending this black hole te uh, technique, uh, the technique of black hole spectroscopy beyond GR? Well, uh, then we will re require theoretical modeling of quasi-normal modes of black holes beyond GR. Uh, so there is an abundance of uh, perturbation calculations, wave equations for quasi-normal modes. This is now, we are talking about uh, black hole perturbation theory. That's all that is required for this problem. So uh, these equations are known for several theories. They're even known for class of theories. So that, uh, here I, I cite this interesting paper by Tata Charles et al. They, are, they, they derive equations for class of theories. So in most of these papers, the main assumption, apart from using uh, non-GR gravity, is the assumption of spherical symmetry, that is non-rotating black holes. So despite the number of, the number of uh, perturbation equations, uh, the solutions of them are relatively few in the literature. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not exactly sure why. So our work here, uh, okay, you can solve this. You can solve this wave equations numerically. You can, like we do in GR, uh, you can obtain the spectrum. Uh, you can obtain the exact spectrum in some sense. But our work here is more uh, analytic minded. Uh, we are using the short wavelength iconal approximation for solving uh, black hole perturbation equations, the equations describing Q and X. So one, one advantage of this approach is that is basically you can apply to any theories, to some extent it's theory uh, agnostic. So uh, in general, uh, if you consider any non-GR theory, you will have uh, two kinds of perturbations. There is a, pertur I'm sorry, there is a perturbation in the metric, that's the tensorial part of the problem. And then there is a scalar field degree of freedom that's perturbed as well. and uh, uh, typically, there will be a coupling between the two perturbations. Uh, so uh, after separation of variables and considering the standard time dependence exponential i minus omega t, the standard one for uh, quasi normal modes, uh, you end up to a couple system of this form. So this just, uh, let's put it here for, uh, as an example, doesn't, doesn't exactly correspond to a particular theory. So on the, on the left hand side, we have something we recognize the Schrodinger type of equations with the radial potential. There is one for the, for the tensor perturbations and one for the scalar perturbations. Here, Psi stands for tensor perturbations, big theta for capital theta for scalar perturbations. X is the tortoise coordinate. Uh, so what coupling does is to add these terms uh, on the right hand side of the equations. So this is a typical system that one has to face when solving for QNMs in non-GR gravity. So you have around five more minutes there. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the equal approximation consists uh, in, in using these ansatz here. It's, it's a WKB kind of ansatz. So the field, the radial again functions in these equations are written as a product of slowly varying am amplitudes. Uh, multiplied by rapidly, rapidly varying uh, phases. This epsilon this is the bookkeeping parameter. This epsilon is supposed to be a, a, a number much, more, much smaller than one, which makes the phase uh, rapidly varying. Uh, the angular, the angular uh, number is of order one over epsilon. So L is it's a number much greater than one, the same approximation. And the QNM frequency is of order L, as it happens in, in GR. So we are looking for GR-like modes. And this equation, this answer is, is supplemented by this condition uh, of vanishing derivative phase derivative at what is called the peak radius. So this basically what distinguishes, what distinguishes the fundamental QNM. This framework only works for the fundamental QNM. So let's consider again Gauss-Bonnet uh, Gauss gravity. I, I've already shown the 
the relevant Lagrangian. Uh, so this is the, the space-time line element. Uh, uh, in this calculation, we have assumed there's a weak uh, coupling parameter. So everything is expanded in terms of the dimension of this number alpha over m squared, so this much less than one. So I saw here the various metric potentials, GTT, GRR, and the background scalar field, again, as an expansion in alpha. Uh, every time you see an F naught prime, it means that the F, the F function of the scalar field will take the derivative and is evaluated at phi equals zero. Right, so as it happens in GR, uh, we have to consider axial parity axial and polar parity perturbations. The axial problem here turns out to be the, the easiest uh, because there is no coupling to the scalar field degree of freedom. So there is one single wave equation as in GR describing tensorial perturbations. The only difference here is that there is also a first, first order derivative present, although this doesn't play any, any role in the iconal analysis. So this is the iconal uh, answers here. So uh, the problem is solved to leading to leading iconal order. This is of order epsilon to minus one, and then to subleading order. And what we ex we extract from those two approximations is the real part of the Q and M and the imaginary part. Um, and as an aside, uh, we also calculate the location of this peak, which in this pro in this case coincides with the the GR uh, value, namely the the radius of the photon ring. So these are the results for the leading order iconal results. There are, these are accurate up to alpha squared. So we, uh, we can recognize here the, the GR, the GR part, and then there is the, the gauss bonnet correction. So just, just as it happens in GR, the, this axial QNMs in gauss bonnet gravity, they admit a geodesic analogy. Namely, these two numbers can be related to the orbital, to the orbital parameters of uh, of the space times photon ring. So this is this is proportional to the orbital frequency and this is proportional to the Lyapun of exponent at the photon ring. So moving to the polar part of the problem. So here is a this is a bit uh, a bit messier because there is coupling between the tensorial and the scalar degrees of freedom. So this system looks very much like the one I showed before, the generic scenario of coupled equations. Uh, so all the functions here, uh, they are derived to alpha square precision. The coupling terms can be functions of the multiple index L. They can be functions of omega. Uh, as you can see, there are functions of multiplying omega square here. Uh, there is a first order derivative here. Uh, one interesting technical detail, which we discovered during the analysis of these equations, is the following, that taking the iconal limit first and then uh, the weak coupling limit is not equivalent to taking those limits in the reverse order. So it doesn't matter which expansion comes first. Uh, so the one, the correct one for this problem is the following. This, what I'm saying basically has to do with the relative comparison between the two small parameters, alpha or epsilon. Uh, the correct ordering here is that the alpha parameter has to be smaller than epsilon. So one can uh, uh, reduce everything smoothly to GR. So these are the results for the, these are leading order iconal results. These are accurate to uh, order alpha squared. So this for the real part, the result for the real part and the imaginary part. Uh, so there's something interesting here because we have two solutions. That's why we have a plus minus everywhere. Uh, so the polar, the polar problem admits two solutions, two families of QNMs, two solutions for the fundamental QNM. And moreover, uh, these two solutions uh, display a Zeeman-like uh, Zeeman kind of splitting because uh, this term is the same with just a plus minus uh, in front. So what is not clear in the polar problem is if there is any connection to the geodesics of the black hole. So that's, uh, this is something left for future work. Uh, we have not been able to find one yet, but uh, you know, my gut feeling is that there is one. You know, I would bet my money that there is one uh, here. And it's just a matter of time for, for us or someone else to, uh, to discover it. Kostas, your principle up, maybe you can wrap it up. I don't yeah, know yeah, I'm, yeah, so I'm I have only a couple of slides, okay. Yeah, thanks. So uh, this is nice because uh, we can compare our corner results against numerical data. 
so there is a, this paper uh, from 2016 by Blasket and Salcido. They consider a particular case of Gauss Bonnet gravity, uh, Dilaton Gauss Bonnet gravity. So this corresponds to a, this choice for the function. So here we saw the comparison between iconal and numerical data for the quadruple QNL as a function of the coupling constant. Uh, this is the real part and the imaginary part normalized to the corresponding uh, GR values. So that's why everything is around one. And so one curve corresponds to the real part and the other to the imaginary. The dots, uh, the dots represent the numerical data. And as you can see, the, uh, the agreement is pretty good. In terms, in terms of absolute uh, precision, we're talking about a few percent precision between iconal results and numerical data. It gets better if you were to add higher order iconal corrections. Uh, so this is the comparison uh, of the polar modes. Um, so our two solutions, our plus minus solutions, corresponds to what is they're called in this in that paper gravitational led modes and scalar led modes. So what are these? Uh, the gravitational led modes correspond uh, reduce to the uh, to gravitational uh, to the gravitational QNM in the limit in the GR limit, while the scalar led modes uh, reduce to the scalar field QNM in the GR limit. So our approximation actually captures those two branches. And here you can see the numerical, uh, the numerical agreement. Uh, here we have, we have considered leading order iconal result, but also uh, higher order iconal results. And as you increase the order of the iconal uh, formula, then the agreement uh, with the numerical data becomes, becomes better and better. So the dots, as before, represent numerical data. So this is the figure for the real part, and this is the figure for the imaginary part. Again, in terms of absolute precision, we are talking about a few percent difference between the two. And that becomes uh, much better when this, the higher order iconal uh, corrections are added. So this is my last slide. Uh, the conclusions. The iconal approximation is it's a, uh, it's a versatile tool for calculating the fundamental QNM of non-GR black holes. Typical precision is few percent when we are working with the leading order iconal results. The same is true in, in GR. This can be improved by adding higher order uh, corrections. This iconal scheme in theory should be equally well applicable to uh, rotating black holes in non-GR theories of gravity, in, in, in which in some cases, uh, in some of these cases, in numerical computation could be, you know, could be less straightforward than what it is in uh, in systems without rotation. As I mentioned, the, we didn't find any geodesic analogy, any connection uh, between the QNMs and the photo ring in the case of coupled uh, perturbations. I think it's only a matter of time for someone to, to, uh, to erase this bullet point. And one, the last bullet is, is really related to the first part of the talk. As you, as you have seen, uh, the Connell QNM formula basically depend on, on the dimensionless coupling constant. So they, uh, they can suffer the same mass suppression effect as the geodesics uh, of, a, of a theory with, uh, with dimensional coupling constants. So this may mean that uh, Lisa's ability to, to probe non-GR gravity with black hole spectroscopy could be compromised by the same mass suppression effect. So this was something uh, I think was first suggested in this recent paper by Marcel Lietal. And I think probably we can we can discuss this later in uh, after the break. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. This is the view we're all missing by not being there, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Kostas, for this comprehensive and very nice talk. I'm sure there are questions, but we are a bit behind time, so we have the discussion round um, moderated after the coffee break, and I suggested we ask the questions um, there. Um, I would say because we're a little bit behind, we started. Uh, 10 minutes later, so 10 to 5 uh, with the discussion, and now we have 15 minutes uh, break. Thanks. Okay, thank you.
Okay, hello everyone. Hope you're back again from the coffee break. So now we have a 40 minutes discussion uh, moderated by Costas Kokodas. And before I give the stage to him, I want to briefly introduce him. Um, Costas Kokodas is professor at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, and he has worked, well, a long time on neutron stars and black holes in particular on their dynamics and stability. And we are very happy that he's here today to moderate this discussion session. Um, Costas, the stage is yours. Feel free to speak up. Thank you. Uh, we have to see how we'll organize uh, the discussion because we have already two interesting talks up to now and there are two <laughs> equally interesting talks after the discussion. So we have to predict probably what the speakers of the next session uh, will say. And uh, we had uh, some questions already in the first talk of Diana, but I would like and before going to Consta's subject, I would like to ask uh, something to Diana and as a base for discussion. I mean, we discuss always about dark matter and uh, modified uh, gravity, one working against the other or complementing one each other. In what extent from the type of experiments or measurements that uh, was more or less it is known up to now we can discriminate among the various theories or approaches to dark matter or to the missing uh, matter content of the universe. I will ask first the speaker, let's say, to comment and then everyone can, let's say, send some comments or uh, express his opinion or her opinion. Diana, are you here? Oh, sorry, yes, I, 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 that was a question yeah, to me. Kind of <laughs> yeah, it was, I thought it was a general discussion. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, but I started with you, I mean, because you are the expert too. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, um, this, is one of, this is one of the, the questions that I, 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 I put there in my talk. I mean, uh, this is uh, one of, uh, to what extent the one can discriminate between the two alternatives. And uh, nowadays we don't have a, an alternative for, for modified gravity as, as, as to explain uh, uh, the observed behavior of the matter. So we don't, we don't have an alternative now. Uh, this, excuse me, my opinion. Uh, so, um, I know this, this is to discuss exactly <laughs> uh, where to look for, for the imprints uh, um, uh, of the nature of the matter. Uh, if it is matter uh, or something else. <laughs> so, you are this is a. Uh, where you were so looking already in your analysis, I mean, I remember. So, or if, so, I mean, I just wanted to if anyone else has a complementary or uh, opinion against it, because we always try to sell that alternative theories can serve, let's say, can cover the gap for dark energy and dark matter somehow. I think dark energy is much easier than dark matter. Is I agree, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's we good. just mess both of them in the discussions. Yeah, yeah. Between what we, we say, we try to sell when we write proposals on what we can. All of us, I mean, it's not. A... Yeah, it's not, I mean, particular to this field, but yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, dark energy in general is much easier than, than, than dark matter. Um, it's too bad that Shinji is not here. There are a few proposals for um, modified gravity dark matter. Uh, you typically have to introduce vector fields, so you have to violate Lorentz symmetry. Although I think the distinction between particle and uh, modified gravity dark matter is a bit uh, subtle in the sense that uh, Diana talks about these very light scalar fields and one could think of those as, uh, as coming from, uh, uh, some, from some modification, as gravitation fields, as some modifications of, uh, of, the, of the, if you want the left hand side of the Einstein equations 
So I'm not sure exactly how particle really, whether this fuzz dark matter that, that she talked about can be really considered as a particle dark matter. Okay. Paolo raised. Yeah. Ah, Paolo. Yes, actually, I think that this uh, question uh, that uh, that he, yeah, he, he rose and uh, um, about the yes the, the, the motivations for this for this spin two case for that matter that's uh, yeah if it is modify gravity I don't know if this will help out. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I didn't want to say anything related to that, but, but I guess so what you are referring to is the fact that maybe for spin two, for a spin two field, you anyway need couplings to matter, no minimal coupling to matter, to, sorry, to gravity, right? So in a sense, it's not like a free particle, like in the spin one case. Is this what you are referring to? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you can, uh, uh, you, you should, you need this interaction. Mm -hmm. Instead of, uh, yeah, do you gonna add this by hand for the spin one or not? So, if I can, I wanted to ask a question related to Costa's comment about dark energy and also with, uh, to Costa's Lampedati's uh, talk. Uh, so, Costa's well, in his talk was talking about non GR effect and these corrections, which for high curvature correction in the Lagrangian will be suppressed in Lisa. So, but on the other end, as Costas Cocotas this time, was uh, saying dark, I mean, dark energy is a stronger motivation perhaps for modified gravity. So I'm wondering, for dark energy, one expects corrections in the opposite regime, so at low curvature. So if I use the same dimension analysis, shouldn't then Lisa or supermassive uh, black holes give much stronger constraints for those theories that can potentially explain dark energy. So which, which one is going to answer first? Costa, you go first. <laughs> you're supposed to answer. Come on, you're the most senior here. <laughs> but I'm the moderator. <laughs> That's right, okay, so you're passing the bucket to me, right? Uh, yeah, you were right. I think uh, this mass suppression should, should also have implications for cosmology, right? Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious. I mean, the effect becomes even more prominent. So uh, it, you, you, can, you can find many cosmology papers where they have the same gauss bonnet theory, the same action, and they write down modified Friedman equations. So if, if you combine this with the LIGO bounds, then these non zero terms, they have to be completely negligible. So probably they will tell you, uh, they will tell you that they can evade everything from binary black holes using screening. I think that will be their generic kind of counter argument. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was also what? thinking about something like, uh, I mean, to also make a bridge with uh, Diana's, uh, Diana's talk, uh, the, for, for spin two, uh, for spin two, well, so say for, for massive gravity, uh, dark energy models, the coupling constant is actually the inverse of a, of a length square. And in that case, I would expect correction from supermassive black holes to be stronger than for stellar mass black holes. So the constraints in the case should be actually enhanced compared to the stellar mass case, I guess. Yeah. Enrico, did you raise your hand to say something? Yeah, I wanted to ask something regarding this. Uh, um, yeah, the same point that Costas raised in his talk. And uh, so, in fact, uh, I think I agree with what, what he said with the general point that you have to be mindful of the, the length scale of your couplings. But I'm not sure I agree with the particular example he chose. And because the, the, the bound by Julie and Berti that he, I mean, the, in this theory, there is this dimensionful coupling in gauss bonnet DGB gravity, there is the, this dimensionful coupling. And the, the paper by Berti and Julie and other papers, they put constraints using LIGO and they say this length must be less than a kilometer. Fine, the, that's very natural. Of course, they assume, however, that the coupling be small. If I take the same theory and solve for the scalar charge of a black hole, it turns out that the black hole reduces to, to Schwarzschild also in the limit of infinite coupling 
square root of alpha. So the scalar charge goes to zero in both limits when, the, when alpha is small and when alpha is large. So this tells me that probably for in the limit of very, very large couplings, which are probable or can be probed by M87 star by the EHT, I believe LIGO won't be able to put constraints. So I'm not sure I agree with the, this is a point we make in a paper with Sebastian and Nicole in some footnote. Enrico, I, I think that the theory you're referring to is when there is a quadratic coupling with sure, the Gaston. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But you because, can... yeah, all, all the arguments by Felix and Emanuele only works yeah, for, but... for theories which have the, the mm, like a zero of the, Fine. the derivative. Yeah, but so... This is a counter example. This is still a counter example to the point that cost is made. So, this is a theory with a dimension full coupling, which has which reduces to, to GR or seems to reduce to GR, at least as far as isolated black holes are concerned, in both limits, large coupling and small coupling. So I'm not sure we can be so, I mean, so clear cut when it comes to... Uh, no, yeah, you are right. All, all these papers, uh, yeah, uh, they implicitly assume that there is an expansion around the, the GR metric, right? So they implicitly assume that all these coupling terms, they, they cannot be infinite in your, in your language, yeah. That's true. Yeah, so maybe that, that's a glimmer of hope, I, I think, that for Lisa and the, the, the EHT. I don't think we can just write them off. The table. Yeah. But then again, yeah, the, the, the vast majority of all these papers, yeah, they work under the assumption that uh, the coupling parameters are small, right? <laughs> Up to unity one. Yeah, well, it, it's because you can't do calculations otherwise. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. Good way for us, and we discussed it in one of the previous discussions. So, I have here a question uh, by Joao Luis Are there any other theories besides Casu Bonnet for which spontaneous scalarization works? Yeah, I would be very much surprised if, were, if that happened only in Gauss Bonnet gravity. You know, uh, the papers I'm aware, of, I'm aware of are, yeah, they all assume they all work with gauss bonnet gravity. And so these are the two PRLs I mentioned in my talk and I forgot, yeah, I, I forgot Enrico's PRL, which was earlier uh, last year. So yeah, apologies, Enrico. Yeah, Enrico. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously that was not intentional. I thought it was. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, no, but uh, yeah, I think it's a general, I mean, you, it, it, I mean, if you have coupling between a scalar field and some other curvature invariants that don't vanish in, uh, in, in, in the GR vacuum, like uh, for instance, uh, I think the Pontryagin density or uh, the Kretschmann uh, invariant, um, yeah, then, then you can have certainly spontaneous scalarization, right? I mean, you have ghosts probably, but if you treat the theory as an EFT, then you should have a spontaneous uh, scalar black hole scalarization, I imagine. Dimitri, do you have to say something? Yeah, well, so I was curious if there are theories that have this um, mass suppression effect, but aren't uh, well constrained for other reasons. So for example, Chern-Simons, right? The constraints right now are horrible just because we don't have uh, peri like very parity violating systems to study, but but right now, like if we get better observations with M eighty seven, it would be able to very well constrain transignment in principle. Yeah, in principle, yes. Although uh, the non black holes uh, metrics calculated in transignments, they're very similar to the one I showed for Gauss Bonnet. So you know, if this dimensionless combination you can build can be greater than one, if you allow them to be greater than one, then you would violate ZR uh, really strongly for a system like, for a LIGO system, right? I'm, I'm not sure, I think in the, this Nair et al paper I mentioned, there are some constraints uh, placed on on Church Simon, on the Church Simon coupling constant, I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, yeah, it's less constrained than gauss Bonnet. that's, that's uh, absolutely true. Yeah. Enrico? The problem with the EHT, if, sorry for jumping in without raising my hand. But the problem with the EHT, I think, is what Costas yeah. mentioned, the degeneracy with the matter, right? So how are we going to, I mean, if we can't 
I mean, I think before testing gravity, we, by deviations from GR, we should measure the spin and the sp and, uh, and have the matter systematics under control. Yeah, I don't know. I think there are people more knowledgeable about this than, than me here. So, I, I, yeah, um, if I can comment on this, actual astrophysicists um, are very skeptical about our calculations because the accuracy that they can measure the spin of the various objects is limited. And uh, I mean, if you have a large error on estimation of uh, the spin, then it's a problem in uh, discriminating between GR and alternative theories of gravity. This is the one of the key problems, let's say. Enrico, do you want to say something again? You're hand is raised so i know sorry it's raised from before i'm sorry okay so. I'll, I'll, to, to lower my hand i don't know um no i i, I agree with, with, with what you say i mean it's also a problem from the theoretical point of view there are not many theories for which we know raising uh, sorry <laughs> we don't know spinning solutions i mean there are, i think you can count them on the on the fingers of a hand Right. I mean, we typically use low spin approximation, but it's not clear to me how whether that is enough for for for, for both for doing what Costas was talking about the spectroscopy and and for uh, for for the shadow of a black hole. Yeah, yeah. I hear these comments for the shadows actually first of all, and of course this applies to quasi normal modes as well. Let's say. So now talking about quasi-normal modes, that because this was also part of uh, Costa's uh, talk, it's, I mean, how, let's say in most of the uh, non-GR tests that we do, we don't have an underlying theory, we just deviate arbitrarily somehow, the care metric. And in this case, the easy way of, the easy thing to study are scalar perturbations but not really gravitational. So we get typically phenomenological, let's say, deviations, and not which are not quality, cannot be applied, let's say, to real observations. So any comment uh, in this direction? I mean, because we see a lot of quasi normal calculate, I mean, calculations in non-GR theories. So what probably I should say something. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, uh, what you're saying is absolutely, is absolutely right. What surprises me is that the limited number of actual QNM solutions. Okay, there are many equations derived for many theories or family of theories. Yeah, but there, uh, the, there is a limited number of actual uh, solutions. But of course, this is only a matter of time to get to to be improved. Right. Uh, one problem. If I can comment about this iconal approximation, it, it does work if you want to approximate the iconal, the fundamental frequency. However, it doesn't work for the overtones. Uh, so that's that's one major uh, limitation. And then there is a, it's a different kind of worms spinning black holes in non-GR non uh, theories, right? There are people in the audience, you know, they know this much better than I do. Uh, it's very difficult to, to, to calculate the background metric and then perturb it. There is no Tukolsky formulas like in in, in GR. Uh, it gets really complicated. But in a sense, the Tukolsky formalism is to be able to separate the equations. Potentially, if I had the theory, even if it is not separable, I can just have a system of yeah things that I can evolve them and find out the numerical integers, frequency and uh, yeah. dumping times, etc. Of course, typically the first or the second harmonic. You can do it. The question is if there is, I mean, for which type of perturbations, the scalar one or the gravitational one? Because gravitational one needs a gravitational theory in the background. And yeah. it is missing in most if, of the cases. Yes, yeah, the questions themselves are missing when uh, yeah, the system is spinning. Yeah, it's true. Because in the generic, in the generic situation, they will be all coupled, right? Once the spin is there, then the, 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 everything will couple to everything else, right? Uh, I actually have a question about uh, about this. So, 
I think that there are calculations uh, in the iconal limit uh, for overtones that uh, use essentially higher order WKB. Uh, so am I wrong about this? No, theoretically you can do it, but the WKB is a little bit problematic if you go to higher order terms, let's say the classical WKB. It is good for the fundamental and the first overtone. But as you go to higher overtones, it fails, let's say. Yeah. So you can get uh, nice phenomenological and simplified, let's say, relations, etc. but up to a certain point. Yeah, and what we're doing is not exactly WKV, you know, it's, uh, it's a lighter version, okay, the, the iconal approximation is a lighter version. Be in a sense, yeah. the zero but you can extend it and you get higher. Yeah. That's you cannot correct that's true. So uh, we did not discuss anything about, because we discussed, I mean, the problems that we have in testing alternatives of gravity when we have shadows or when we have uh, quasi-normal modes. What about emeries in this case? I mean, should we discuss it here or should I move to another, uh, let's say, Question because Emrys also suffer from similar problems, let's say. Yeah, so so basically I, I can answer with a with a question of uh, of my own, right? Uh, let's assume if let's assume that this mass suppression does work for, for Emrys. So uh, per orbit the system is not affected by the non-zero degrees of freedom. How about the entire spiral? That's the thing. How much how much error you, you accumulate despite the mass suppression uh, over the entire spiral after, after monitoring how many, 10 to the five cycles. Yeah, so, yeah that's, that's my question to, yeah, to, to the audience, right? I think Paolo posted something here, an old paper where we did sort of that analysis. Whether it UNMs, with either QNMs or Emrys, which one was the, the most sensitive or the more sensitive of the two? To, to the well, you, you have a comment in the chat, right? Well, that, that, that sounds analysis, but I didn't want to, to, to just right, yeah, that's a different. talk too much and it was about something you guys said. But regarding this point, I think, yeah, Emrys are more sensitive than, than QNMs. I mean, it's true, the problem is more difficult, but exactly because you accumulate so many cycles, it's going to be more. Uh, more sensitive, but it's the same problem, I think, as what Paolo was also saying, that when you do things in the time domain, as you were suggesting to do for QNMs, and the, you encounter the same problems that you have when you study the full problem. So the, beyond general relativity, I mean, the, the way wave equations are coupled, so the principal part of the equation changes, it's not clear how to solve the Cauchy problem. So there is a reason why people haven't looked, I think, at QNMs or Emrys beyond the GR. And it's not merely um, just computational power missing or uh, human hours uh, missing. I mean, it's really the, the framework is not, uh, when the equations are not separable and you tend to do things in the time domain, it's not obvious conceptually how to do it. Well, Enrico, I, well, I should have raised my hand, sorry. I don't know if, hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Costa, sorry, I'm interrupting. I should have raised the hands and. Uh, uh, yes. I did. No, I mean, I don't know if it fits, but I mean, there is also the, the essentially the, the, the workflow of the paper that we did with Thomas and uh, Nicole as well, that can simplify, I mean, testing using, I mean, if this is what uh, Costas was asking, during these spirals, I mean, you can find simplification for scalar fields in general. I mean, on the, the, on the framework that we developed with Nicola and, uh, uh, and Thomas and Leonardo. So uh, it's, I mean, we're essentially like tensor equation decoupled from the scalar one. So essentially the, 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 all the burden of the calculations, I mean, fits within uh, computing like the scalar flux and adding this to the phase evolution that you will have in GR. It's so not clear. Uh, yeah, no, please. Oh, it's not clear to which, which extent, I mean, uh, the, the simplification hold, especially when you start to take into account like self-force correction. So, I mean, I don't know where like the simplification occurs, but there are like uh, 
only for Emrys and for like some theories, there are some simplification that allows you to compute like the, the fully spiral like in a very simple way. So this, this enters at a, at, uh, at a higher order in the mass phase, right? It's not leading order effect, is that right? What? So say it, say it again. So the 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 influence of the non-zr degrees of freedom. No, this is actually the opposite. I mean, at the leading, I mean, it it actually affects like the adiabatic evolution of the same order in Q in the mass ratio of the gr term. Right. So leading order. Yeah, but it's suppressed by the couplings essentially. So in any case, it's smaller. Okay. And the 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 point is that this simplification indeed, I mean, is uh, you don't know to which extent, of course. In yeah. Q. So, I mean, if you are go going to compute like post adiabatic orders, you don't know. I mean, uh, for sure, I mean, it's not going to be that simple. Yeah. And then there's the issue of orbital resonances in a non care background, right? So, this that was the paper, the recent paper by the TAT group. Uh, and there was early papers by uh, Hans Apostolatos and collaborators, right? So, my take on these papers is that there is a clear sign of. Uh, while, while the system transits uh, non-orbital resonance, there is a clear sign of, of, the, of the underlying non care space time compared to what will happen in the same situation in, in, in GR, right? Yeah. Nicola, do you want to say something? Because I can see your uh, Yes. No, I just wanted to add a comment about the um, calculation of quasi normal modes in. Mm, like for spinning solutions in theory is different from GR. Like may maybe an approach which is not complete, but it might simplify a lot. Like the picture that Enrico was talking about is like considering slow rotation and try to work in the in the in the frequency domain, like by adding corrections to the Schwarzschild frequencies or like to the frequencies of the QNMs for for any solution in any chosen theory, but like in the static case and like adding corrections up to whatever order in the spin. I think this, I don't know, something that Paolo has been working on a lot and it's something that in principle should be doable for some theories or... Um, yeah, if I can add something, I agree with what Nicola said, uh, I guess that at some point, so uh, the main question probably is to which level of accuracy you want the quadrant modes computed. And maybe if the remnant is spinning sufficiently fast and you expect it to be say 0.7, something like that, in most cases, you need many orders in this low rotation approximation. And it becomes quickly a mess, especially for theories with uh, strong curvature corrections. My, my, I don't know, my take on this is that it becomes eventually almost as complicated as doing the full simulation and the full theory that is something that now people are, are, start, are starting doing. So maybe the best approach will really be do the time evolution, look at the remnant in the, in the time domain and look at the ring down there. Uh, one more. Caio, do you want to say something? Oh, yes, thank you. So I have a question about this, this time domain as well. Uh, I, I always thought that if you had a, a, a stationary space time, you could always uh, decompose your uh, time dependence with uh, frequency, right? You then work with the frequency domain. So the first question is, is, is this always true? I mean, if you have a rotating black hole in alternative theories of gravity, I mean, can, can, can't you avoid working in the time domain by doing this decomposition? And also about the time domain thing. Uh, so I, I was wondering about the, the detection of the modes using these time domain evolutions, because uh, it, it could be that you have some oscillation that are not true modes of the system, like you have in, uh, in exotic compact objects, right? Because in that case, you have a ring down that is the same as the black hole, but the, the modes that are in this ring down are not the modes that you have from your exotic compact object. So how can one be sure that if you do a time evolution in, in alternative theories of gravity, 
you will not have some modes that are not not actually modes of the black holes, but something else happening in the I don't know in the interaction between the, the that the, comes from the compound. data or what? Or the way that you sorry something that comes from specifying certain initial data or what? I mean, I don't know. Not the initial data, because, for instance, in this exotic compact object case, what you have is that uh, you have a signature from the potential, right? So if you solve the equation for the modes, you will not get a Schwarzschild mode. But if you do the time evolution and try to see uh, what is the frequency that the response is oscillating, you get the Schwarzschild frequencies, although they are not modes of your space time. So imagine that you have something, some interaction going on in alternative theories of gravity that shows you modes that are, are not modes of your system. So it just happened that this your system oscillates because of some effects, some, I don't know, some something trapped or, uh, or less. Can, can you be sure that what you get from the time evolution will be the modes of the space time or not something else? Uh, Paolo, do you want to say something? I can... um, yes, so uh, trying to reply to Kayo's question. So th for the first part, yes, I believe that if uh, uh, the background is stationary in any theory, I mean, there is a killing vector field and you can uh, do a frequency domain analysis. Of course, then the equations can be three plus one if there are no symmetries or two plus one if there is axis symmetry. Uh, or if there is a probability one plus one like in care, but it has to be very special. Uh, related to the time domain, I think I agree with what Kayo said, but on the one end, I mean, from the data analysis point of view, we do see time series. So eventually we should not compare frequencies maybe, but directly time series. And there are, I think, models in which what Kayo was talking about actually works. For example, if you take, I don't know, any, uh, of this quadratic gravity theory, but with the scalar field uh, with a mass term. In that case, the scalar field will have long lived modes because of the mass term. And I think that if the mass is very small, you, you are not gonna see them initially in the ring down, but only at very late times. So these are examples in which the prompt ring down will be different from what the just a quasi normal mode analysis in the frequency domain will tell you. This will be the difficulty of discriminating between theories that there is also always a problem let's say here anything extra that we add there there is a how much it contributes to the observables and maybe it's the next generation of lisa that can see something like this i don't know uh, i would like i mean there is a very interesting talks following now but there was also an interesting talk by nielsen yesterday about this is also introduction to the Paulus talk afterwards about the echoes, which is more or less ringing of uh, our ultra compact objects that we have here. And he mentioned the difficulties of identifying echoes, and uh, more or less he presented results in relation also to what LIGO announced in relation to this object. So I would like, I don't know if is the right time for Paolo to tell us something about this or afterwards in his talk, let's say. Because um, there was also discussion about this uh, yesterday. Yes, unfortunately, yeah, I have to apologize because yesterday I, I could not attend to teaching duties. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I will discuss a bit in my in my talk. I think that the main message that I would like to, to pass is that uh, um, it might be hard. Uh, well, actually, there are two messages. One is that uh, echo search, even negative echo searches, can be translated into an upper bound on the reflectivity of the object, which eventually will tell us something on models and will rule out models. And the other is one should be also careful about the waveform, uh, uh, the, the waveform approximant that one uses for, for echo searches, because in general, the waveform and the signal in the time domain is very complicated. There are a lot of effects that uh, some of the uh, waveforms you so far missed. And it's, it's an important question. L later on, I will show you an example 
of a concrete model in which there are echoes and the signal is much more complicated than what a simple analysis would tell us. So, yeah, I agree that it's complicated. Yes. Okay, uh, so it's up to the organizers. Should we continue the discussion or pass the... We have five more minutes left for the discussion. Maybe I would ask something to everyone or those who are involved in this business. I mean, most of these works related to echoes have been focusing on the ring down part, of course. Also, some works on the um, early in spiral to see if there's some deviations um, in the in spiral waveform. What's the status with full numerical relativity simulation? Are there any serious attempts to model the full process of these horizonless um, objects, or are the technical complications still too large to put this in a numerical relativity framework? Are you talking about what uh, exotic compact objects or? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Then I think Paolo can further yeah. comment. Yeah, I think I think hopefully tomorrow in the discussion session for for the numerical relativity beyond GR, I was hoping to open it up a little bit more to just not just numerical relativity beyond GR, but numerical relativity beyond standard stuff, if you like. So maybe hopefully tomorrow in the afternoon, uh, uh, we have a like a discussion on it. Okay, excellent. I mean, I don't want to like, stop people from discussing it right now, but I'm just mentioning. <laughs> it's good that you advertise it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Eugene, may, may I ask, so, because I was about to reply that, of course, it depends on what you mean, what one means by exotic compact objects. If, if you include boson stars, there are a lot of simulations and, and, and studies and that can be done properly. For if, if you instead have in mind more phenomenological models, which are sort of ad hoc, that, of course, becomes even more difficult to set up a numerical framework. So Eugene, are you going to discuss uh, what are you going to discuss tomorrow? Yeah, I think I think that's part of the thing that we're going to discuss, right? So like several things. Like one is basically the standard problem of forming like actual beyond GR theories where you want to like how do you formulate a well post formalism, for example. And then if let's say we extend it to uh, a beyond GR, like beyond standard model stuff like boson stars, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different models. How do we, what is the ad hoc models? What, I mean, you are right in a sense, it's fairly ad hoc in many ways. I think it is, it is in a sense a problem because numerical relativity means that you have to set it up and it wastes, a lot, it has a lot of, no, I wouldn't say what, I'm terrible, like Freud and sleep, let's say it's waste, but it's a lot of resources to try to do a single simulation, right? Each project is kind of a PhD project. So how do we decide, you know, it's not like just pen and paper where you can sit down and just write down the equation and solve it. It is a, a amount, how do we as a community decide what is the right theory to proceed? And I think this is part of the discussion, hopefully that we can have a, a nice discussion about it tomorrow. Is, is, does that answer your question or at least? Yeah, it does, thanks. Caio? Yes, I, I, ha I have a question. Actually, is a comment on Enrico comment in the chat. Uh, and this brought some uh, questions in my mind because, uh, so Enrico asked it about the resonances in uh, Emrys. And I was thinking that, do, I mean, yeah, and actually is a question for everyone here. Do we have a model to, to study these resonances in Emory, because, for instance, when you do Emory, you usually we usually do this uh, uh, adiabatic approach, right, in which the the orbit evolve very slowly. But when you have resonances, you have uh, some, you know, uh, huge amount of energy going out of your system. So could this potentially lead to to a loss? Uh, in eccentricity more than we can uh, predict with the adiabatic approximation, or is the adiabatic approximation still fine to, to, to study these kinds of, of things? If I may, because since I was asking the question, this is exactly why I was, uh, I was asking it, because in GR, there are resonances in GR as well, in Emrys, uh, and those, in fact, in fact, break exactly what you, you mentioned, the adiabatic approximation. So here, I, I understood from Diana's talk that uh, the, the scalar field has, a, uh, or the dark matter field has a, some characteristic frequency. And uh, typically that's given by the mass and the mass is supposed to be small for cosmological purposes. So it, it's right 
in the right it's in the right ballpark for Lisa to be sensitive to because the Lisa is low is low frequency experiment it's a millihertz experiment and I don't think anybody studied these resonances how they they change when you you have this color field so in GR they've been studied there is the Emily enters a resonance when the ratio between the orbital frequency and the precession frequency is, uh, is a finite, uh, is a ratio of two integers. Uh, but I wonder if yeah, the same can, I mean, something similar can happen when the frequency of the emery becomes comparable to the mass of the scalar field. Yeah. I was, I was asking precisely because we had the, 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 the lecture on the boson star simulations and we, we did observe some resonances when we, we analyzed the boson stars in the Emory case. And if the boson star is less, is less compact, if the boson star is not so compact, this resonance occurs even further away from, from the center of the star. So if you have something like a black hole with a scalar structure or something like that, there could be some resonance even in GR. So, I mean, that would be interesting to see because um, depending on the compactness of these structures, you can have uh, something that, I mean, some motion that pass through many resonant states and having a formalism to properly describe this it would be very nice, I think. Okay, so it was a very nice discussion around and I hope we also have more questions going on in the Slack channel about this. Um, I would move on now to the next talk. Um, and first of all, thank Costas again for moderating this and preparing this. Thanks for being here. So um, the next talk will be by um, Paolo Pani from the Sapienza University of Rome. And uh, he will talk about new physics on the horizon um, and basically continue our discussion on, on echoes. Paolo, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I will give you also five minutes uh, notifier. Okay, thanks Sebastian, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, for having me here. It's a pleasure, of course, it would be better uh, to be there in person. Um, anyway, so uh, please let me know if you don't see my, my slides, of course. Um, so I would like to uh, discuss some recent developments and challenges in test of the nature of dark compact objects and discuss potential signature for new physics uh, at the horizon scale. Um, during my talk, something that I would like to discuss is how, for example, to distinguish a curved black hole uh, by its multipolar structure from uh, other objects like microstage geometry uh, that arise in the fat loop boson string theory, uh, which have instead a very distorted uh, shape compared to the, to the curved black hole as shown in this uh, picture here. Uh, so first of all, some motivations. So we know that now black holes are essentially everywhere. Uh, so for the youngest of you in the audience, this wasn't the case up until a few years ago. So now it, it, become, it, it looks obvious, but it, it, it was not so um, just uh, some time ago. Uh, and now we have very strong uh, um, evidence and observations coming from different electromagnetic bands and different mass ranges in the gravitational wave uh, uh, regime uh, for the existence of black holes and for the fact that they very well, um, are pretty well described by the prediction of GR and the fact that they are curved black holes. So one might ask why testing the black hole picture and uh, there are at least I think three motivations. So the first one is that we might want to search for other compact objects different from black holes and neutron stars. Uh, and besides, I mean, looking for them out of curiosity, these objects can also explain uh, problems that we have right now in astrophysics. For example, explain the mass gap events that LIGO and Virgo sees both in the lower mass gap and in the upper mass gap that are sort of clay at clash with um, standard stellar formation scenarios. But also, we don't know exactly how to form uh, uh, supermassive black holes at high redshift, and uh, uh, objects different from black holes may be uh, exotic uh, supermassive black hole sets. Furthermore, as we learned from other talks, there is a big uh, dark component uh, of matter in the universe, and that can form exotic objects like bosons or axon stars or others. 
Then there is a more fundamental question. So can we try to use observations to test uh, possible quantum effects uh, in black holes? And this is related with really fundamental questions in, in gravity and in fundamental physics, like the information loss paradox, the existence of singularity, the loss of causality inside uh, the horizon, etc. Um, resolving these problems sometimes require new physics at the horizon scale, as in the firewall proposals or some non-local effects that people have studied, or replacing the classical black hole completely, as in the fastball proposal in string theory, in which the black hole is uh, replaced by a, a huge number of regular horizonless microstate geometries. This may look a bit uh, maybe too ambitious, uh, but let me just stress that if we are not going to look for this effect now, maybe we will never do it because the, the effects and the phenomenology that we can study now and say in the next 20 years with the third generation detectors and LISA is essentially very similar. It's almost the same as now. So this is actually the best situation we can have to, uh, to test this effect. And finally, we want to quantify uh, for a given source the black holeness across many different mass ranges, for example, by performing Bayesian model selection. So we need two models, the black hole one and another one to try to really compare them in a quantitative way. Let me also stress that any observation of uh, evidence for exotic compact objects, essentially objects which are not black holes nor neutron stars, will imply new physics or new matter fields and will really shake physics this ground, so it's really an important uh, problem. Um, so there is an entire zoo of exotic compact objects, and I don't want to discuss them in any detail. Let me just mention that they can be divided in solutions to GR with exotic matter sources, and boson stars are the typical examples, uh, or solutions to modify gravity, so gra GR plus uh, corrections, and this is the case, for example, of microstate geometry and some wormhole solutions. There is no sharp distinction in many cases, and uh, uh, some models, as I was mentioned before, are really phenomenological, so they lack formation mechanism, we cannot study the dynamics or their stability. Some others instead are coherent and well-motivated, let's say, ab initio models, um, and well, this is despite the fact that some people think there are no uh, such models, but in fact there are some theories and, and, and frameworks in which this can be studied properly. I will try to focus on the phenomenology, mostly gravitational wave phenomenology, agnostically, um, even though we'll focus on some model uh, occasionally. And I can point to these two ray views for a more comprehensive uh, analysis. So let me start by um, telling how to quantify, say, the shade of darkness. So for given observations, how can we constrain the level at which this is, does not uh, uh, say, agree with the standard black hole picture. So for sure, one dimension uh, that we, one parameter that we are interested in is the compactness. Uh, we can define the compactness in terms of a parameter epsilon that parameterizes deviations from the curved black hole. R plus here is the location on the curved uh, horizon. Another dimension in this parameter space is the reflectivity. Black holes, classical black holes, of course, have zero reflectivity at the horizon. Um, and therefore, in this diagram, they sit here, zero epsilon, zero are uh, zero reflectivity coefficient. Uh, on the other end, exotic compact objects might populate this diagram in different corners. For example, this upper right panel, small compactness, no absorption. This is the typical example of boson stars. Or small compactness and large absorption. This is some, uh, the example of what is sometimes called diffuse fastballs or large compactness, no assertion, as in the case of uh, Grava stars. And finally, the region which is most difficult to probe when there are there is large compactness and large absorption, and this is the case of what sometimes are called tight fastballs. In this diagram, there is a big discriminator, which is the presence of a photon sphere or the light ring, which I will use to distinguish between sort of small compact objects or large compact objects. And let me just mention that if you have some quantum corrections in mind, this parameter epsilon has to be of order 10 to minus 40. So you see, this, this is not in scale by any means. And if you really want to probe regions of, say, quantum correction on the horizon scale, you have to keep in mind that epsilon is extremely small. So the question is, can we constrain and how can we constrain this parameter space now and in the future? An interesting point is that within GR, under certain assumptions, 
Buchdahl theorem uh, guarantees that this epsilon parameter cannot be arbitrarily small, so there is no continuous black hole limit, uh, and the compactness is bounded uh, from above. Uh, assuming that matter is described by a perfect fluid, is isotropy, uh, isotropic and static. So ways to, to violate these bounds are considering some different matter fields, as in the case of boson stars. So these are solutions to general relativity with a complex uh, bosonic field, it can be scalar, it can be vector field, with some self-interactions. And uh, um, this theory allows for compact uh, uh, massive solutions, was maximum mass and compactness depends on the parameters of the model. I think that tomorrow we'll have more discussion about this, also about the interesting fact that spinning scalar boson stars are unstable unless they are, they are strongly interacting. And I think Joseph Font will talk about this tomorrow. Another way to evade the Bukdal uh, limit is considering anisotropic stars. So adding an, an anisotropic fluid in general relativity, this can be done in a full covariant way as we discussed in this paper here. And interesting enough, the uh, increasing the anisotropy of the fluid provides solutions which are more massive, more compact, can, be, uh, can beat Bukdal limit and also be as compact as black holes. And here, the crucial point is that anisotropies are really necessary to, to keep the, the object together. Finally, an, a different example are um, exotic compact objects beyond general relativity. And here, let me discuss a bit the fuzzball proposal in string theory. So as I was mentioning before, in the fuzzball paradigm, a classical black hole is interpreted as an ensemble of a huge number of microstates, which are regular, so there is no singularity in the space-time, and they are also horizonless, so there is no event horizon. And the huge entropy of a black hole is interpreted as a, the number of, a micro, of the microstates, and in some cases it can be accounted for really by counting the microstates. These geometries, which are regular and uh, horizonless, are solutions to some low-energy effective field theory, um, typically supergravity theory, and the pros, the big pros of this model is that, besides being well motivated, um, in these models, the mass is a free parameter. So for boson stars and for essentially almost any other solutions, there is a length scale in the problem. And for example, a given model of boson stars that can explain stellar mass black holes cannot explain supermassive one and vice versa. Here, instead, the mass is a free parameter, just like in the sparse solution. So fastballs can explain all uh, black holes in the universe in principle. The cause is that they are very complicated and mostly known for uh, extremely charged black holes, uh, what are called BPF states. Uh, but there was also a very recent paper a few days ago by uh, Josip Mena uh, and collaborators showing that how to construct these very complicated solutions beyond super supergravity. There are some open issues on this proposal, uh, which are also very interesting. And I suggest you this review by Daniel Meyerson, which discusses both these issues and the phenomenology of fastball, fastball in much more detail than I can do. Um, so Costas, in the previous talk, discussed uh, a bit shadows of uh, to test generativity. Here, I will take advantage of this talk and really just provide you two slides on uh, what we can uh, learn from the nature of compact object using uh, essentially electro electromagnetic observation and lensing. So one important point to keep in mind is that when radiation is emitted very close to the uh, horizon or in a region of space-time which is very, um, uh, very compact, not only is the radiation highly redshifted, but also the escape angle for radiation becomes very small. So if you take some source of radiation, isotropic radiation very close to the horizon here, most of it will actually be emitted within the light ring of the object. It will start going around, never escaping to infinity. And this is in practice the big limitation to study, um, I mean, to put very strong constraints on, uh, on the compactness of the object using electromagnetic observations because uh, the moment the, the system has a light ring, it will behave very different from less compact solutions. Um, and people over the years have studied a lot the possibility of distinguish a black hole from an exotic compact object using shadows. Here I'm showing three example uh, papers that compare black hole with a boson star. 
uh, both in terms of uh, the signal from accreting material or just from lensing. And the upshot of this is that if the compact objects are not compact enough, in fact, um, they are almost Newtonian from this point of view, and they can be quite different from the black holes in this case here, in these cases here. But on the other hand, if they are uh, as compact as to have a light ring, things are more complicated and the two objects are more difficult to distinguish. So I think that a, a ballpark constraint on this parameter epsilon for shadows is having epsilon for their unity, which means that we can probe the existence of light rings, uh, as Costas was saying before, but not for sure going to much smaller values of epsilon. And also there might be the degeneracy with accretion model and uh, matter content. Um, one may ask, how about accretion? Because, uh, well, for example, supermassive objects are sitting there at the center of the axis for essentially a very long time, and they might be accreting at some fraction of the Eddington rate. And in this paper here, uh, it was shown that assuming thermal equilibrium and the fact that there is a hard surface in the space time instead of an horizon, there is a very strong constraint on this parameter epsilon that can be put just by the fact that we don't observe thermal radiation from this hard surface. And this bound is really incredible. It's 10 to minus 14, which is orders of magnitude better than uh, those that I was mentioned before. Unfortunately, even just assuming a tiny absorption of, of this, sur this putative surface, instead of being perfectly reflected, destroys this bound quite completely. This was shown in this paper here. So one has always to keep in mind that it's a, at least a two-dimensional parameter space. Let me now move to gravitational wave based test. And the, the single picture I would like to uh, have you in mind is the following here, in which the nature of compact objects enters a different, uh, in different phases, both in the spiral, in terms of multipolar moments, tidal heating or tidal deformability, as I will discuss later, or in the merger and post-merger phases, in terms of a distorted ring down or echoes or other effects that might occur uh, after du or during the merger. Let me start by black hole spectroscopy or gravitational spectroscopy in general. Uh, well, I would skip all the standard part that you are already familiar with. So we can uh, use gravitational observations, especially in the future, to measure many um, quasi normal modes potentially, so uh, frequencies and damping times. And the smoking guns uh, in the prompt ring down um, uh, for exotic compact objects are essentially the same as for modified gravity. So there might be shifts of frequency and damping times. So the quasi normal mode spectrum might be slightly different. Um, there might be extra modes. For example, there can be extra polarization, scalar modes in boson stars or uh, other modes. And of course, the question is to which level are these modes excited in a merger, for example. And other effects like breaking of some symmetries of the quasi-normal mode spectrum that exists for black holes in GR. There are many parameterizations that uh, are not perfect but can be used to uh, null hypothesis test for sure. And also detecting several quasi-normal modes can be used to sort of attempt a metric reconstruction, so really understanding the, the geometry of the space underlying space time. Um, so in this paper here, we tried, so in this paper here by Elisa Maggio, uh, Luca Bonifante and uh, um, myself and uh, uh, Anupan uh, Mazunar, uh, we tried to uh, answer the following question. How does an exotic compact object ring down uh, in a sort of model agnostic way? And what we tried to do was to extend the membrane paradigm, um, the cold membrane paradigm to the case of exotic compact object. So in this uh, paradigm, um, the uh, classical horizon is replaced by a fictitious uh, viscous fluid with a given uh, shear viscosity and uh, uh, bulk viscosity. And it turns out that for this value of the shear viscosity, the fluid behaves exactly like a Zwarshi black hole. So what we did was to extend this model in the case in which the viscosity is a free parameter that is related with the reflectivity by this relation here. And epsilon is also a free parameter, so the compactness can be different. And then you can compute the modes in this two-dimensional parameter space and look when they deviate from the GR1, say, by 10, 20 percent. And these regions, shaded regions here, for the real and imagined part, 
are those in which the, the deviations are larger than what the what observed for GW15 and 914. So essentially the shaded area is the one not excluded by GW15 or 914, um, which is already pretty small. A black hole sits here on the on the top part of this panel on the on the left part when epsilon goes to zero. Interesting enough, a factor in increase a factor 10 in the SNR will totally constrain this, this model. So we'll even remove uh, remove this part that is hard to, to exclude at, the, at this moment. Um, of course, you might ask, why are you cutting this diagram at uh, epsilon 10 to minus 2? And the reason is that for smaller values, as probably Alex Nielsen was discussing yesterday, the prompt trim down is, can be arbitrarily close to the black hole um, uh, because it's essentially related with the photosphere uh, modes, uh, while uh, the, the presence or the of the absence of the horizon can appear later on in, for, in the forms of uh, reflect, gravitational wave reflected by the object that are called gravitational wave echoes, as shown in this, in this plot here. There's been a lot of work on this subject, and probably yesterday was already discussed. So here, I just want to mention a few things. First, that in many models, the echo delay time scales logarithmically with epsilon, which is a blessing because if epsilon is super small, this delay time will not be huge, and also, that echoes are actually pretty generic uh, signature of the absence of horizon. So a classical horizon, of course, absorbs everything. So you cannot get any of these corrections. But if you don't have a classical horizon, because there is a stellar-like interior or some quantum effect or any structure, essentially, you will get, you are bound to get some radiation reflected. Then the question is, how big are these, 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 uh, these echoes? Because they may be tiny, in fact, and undetectable. But you are bound to get some for, uh, I'd say, uh, a non-standard black hole. Um, there has been a lot of progress in echo modeling and searches, and I won't have time to discuss this, but I can suggest this, this uh, recent uh, review. So about echo detectability, I'm sure that Alex yesterday discussed uh, uh, echo searches in LIGO and Virgo, and the fact that there is no statistical evidence included in the latest uh, gravitational wave catalog. Uh, it's, uh, from my side, it's actually pretty exciting that uh, near horizon corrections are within reach and there are actually now echo search pipelines in LIGO Virgo. The situation was not uh, so uh, optimistic, I mean optimistic, so positive uh, just a few years ago, so I'm, I'm really happy about that. Uh, let me just mention that the prospect in the future to constrain the reflectivity of the object um, with the third generation detector in LISA compared to what LIGO can do right now, it's very optimistic. So constraints on the reactivity will become much, much better uh, in the future. Another point to keep in mind, which is very important, is that what I was mentioning before in the discussion session, that the, the echo waveform is way more complicated than what one could naively think. For example, here I'm showing a slideshow uh, of, the, of the echoes for a model with different spin of the random and different reflectivity. By the way, this is a complex possibly frequency dependent coefficient, so it can be very complicated. And here we are considering a, a system in which the ring down is linearly polarized, and the two colors are the two polarization of the post merger or post merger of the uh, echo waveform. And as you can see, depending on the spin or the reflectivity, you might get that the second polarization is excited. So there is mixing of polarizations. There are sometimes cases in which echoes are missing. There is frequency and amplitude modulation. So the signal is really, really complex. And well, it, it will require a proper account for this in order to, to, to detect the details of this, of this model. Um, so up until now, I discussed something that is mostly phenomenological, as I was saying. So there is really no underlying model theories behind here. So let me spend a few words on the uh, on a specific model instead. So in a very recent paper led by uh, Taishi Keda here in Rome, uh, and the, in collaboration with the Tor Vergata string theory group um, in, again in Rome, we were studying how the black hole microstage, microstage geometry rings down 
uh, using a uh, test scalar field for simplicity, uh, of course, but doing the full problem. So really solving a three plus one evolution. And the reason is that, as I was mentioning before, these geometries do not have any space, uh, spatial isometry. So they don't have any, any symmetry in the spatial direction, but they are stationary. So what I'm showing here are snapshot, time snapshot of the ring down for a black hole in this first row and for two uh, microstage geometries that are discussed, uh, what well, described here is the, the embedding diagram. And two points to keep in mind is that the initial perturbation here was spherical, a spherical pulse. So as you can see for a black hole, the shape remains spherical and everything dies off very quickly because there is a ring down, everything dies off. For a fastball, two important points are that the shape is not spherical anymore because the background is not spherical. So it's using different modes. And also, um, there is signal also at very late times compared to the black hole case. And this is, the re this is due to the fact that there is no horizon. So there is some nice movie that I want to show you. Let me take advantage of the fact that I'm now uh, sharing my desktop so, so to just go to our nice web page and open one of these uh, movies that Taishi uh, produced and, and play it for you. So what you will see here is the response of a fastball of, of this microstage geometry uh, to a spherical perturbation. And uh, um, what you will see is that the perturbation is not spherical. And you clearly see that there are um, uh, signatures of the fact that the geometry is very distorted to start with. And there is a sort of uh, dipolar form and quadrupolar form of this signal. But most interesting, if you look at the time scale unit of the mass of the system, you see that there is still radiation uh, with very interesting features very far um, in time after the main, uh, the, 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 the prompt ring down, which essentially is a, a clear signature of something beyond the, the black hole horizon. Um, to be more precise, here I'm showing the uh, ring down of the black hole uh, under spherical symmetric perturbation. So there is just a standard ring down and a power law tail um, for L equal zero modes. And if you perturb with a dipole, you will get L equal one modes. For a fastball, it's instead very different because uh, first, if you start with a spherical symmetric profile, you, you have ring down both at L equal zero and at L equal two. Not only that, you will get an initial ring down, which coincides, it's very similar to the black hole case. So it dies off very quickly with the quasi normal modes of the, of the black hole. But at later times, you will see that there are repeated signals, uh, which are very much reminiscent of the echoes I was talking uh, about before. And finally, there is a late time behavior given by the, the modes of the fastball uh, space time, which are long lived. So this is, again, to say this is a concrete model. is much more complex than what a phenomenological model can tell you. But still, the genetic features are there. So repeated signal, something that survives much uh, after the black hole case. And of course, it would depend on many other uh, interesting properties of this particular model. Let me now quickly move to the inspiral part. Uh, so in the inspiral part, also to try to address some question that Sebastian had uh, before. So can we distinguish echoes from black holes looking at the inspiral? We can, uh, and there are different signals, the uh, signatures. So the first one are the multiple moments that enter the point particle phase in the inspiral. For a curved black hole, the multiple moments satisfy the very well-known uh, no hair theorem property. So the mass and current multiple moments depends only on the mass and spin of the curved black hole. And in fact, if one builds the embedding diagram for the systems, um, you can build the, you can visualize mass multiple moments as the shape of this uh, plot that I'm showing and current moments as the color scheme on the surface of this, okay? And this is first large and this will be an exaggeration for a curved black hole. For exotic compact objects, even in the axisymmetric case, you might have deviations. So you might have objects which are not equatorially symmetric, or have moments that differ from, from the curve ones, both in the mass and in the current sector. Interesting enough, there is a sort of no hair, uh, sorry, hair conditioner theorem for exotic compact objects that under certain assumption, when this object becomes very compact, their deviation, delta M and delta S, has to go to zero sufficiently fast. In particular, either linearly 
or logarithmically with epsilon if they are spinning used. And again, this is interesting because if epsilon is super small, you may get corrections here, which are not uh, negligible in this parallel phase. Um, working on this, I mean, building on this uh, in this paper here, led by, by Guillaume Reposo, who is, by the way, defending his PhD thesis tomorrow, also on this topic, we built various um, solutions to vacuum GR that are essentially arbitrarily deformed. So they might have moments that a curved black hole solution does not have. They are analytical, even though very complicated. You can download them from this uh, web page here. The situation is even more complicated because for fat balls and for certain boson star models, uh, not only you can break uh, um, I mean, you can have different model, moments from curve, but you can break the equatorial symmetry of a curve call, even the axial symmetry. Uh, so having not a multipole uh, of a quadruple moment uh, or scalar, but a quadruple moment tensor, so that it will depend on different numbers. And uh, the embedding diagram for these solutions um, is actually compared to curve, is very deformed. So it can be deformed both in the axis symmetry direction and on the equatorial plane. There are interesting properties that emerge very recently from the multiple moments. For example, for certain fastball solutions, the multiple the ratios between multiple moments are universal. This was studied in these papers here. Um, for certain BPS black hole solutions, the multiple some multiple moment invariants are minimum for black holes compared to the fastballs. Uh, but this was recently shown not to be the case for non-supersymmetric states, as shown in this paper here. And anyway, the bottom line is that current current moments uh, should be uh, sorry, current models for gravitational waves should be extended beyond the curve symmetries to account for all these moments that are, that are non-zero uh, in the black hole case. Um, there are also other corrections in the inspire. One is the tidal heating, so the fact that black holes absorb radiation while exotic compact objects, in principle, do not. This effect is small, at least for comparable masses, uh, for comparable mass binaries. It might be larger for uh, emeries and intermediate mass black holes. Uh, and another effect, which is instead more promising, is detecting the tidal deformability of an uh, exotic compact object binaries. And the reason is that for black holes in GR, the love number, which, the, which define the tidal deformabilities, are exactly zero. And so there are no 5 p.m. corrections to the teleformability phase coming from black holes. This was recently studied also for spinning black holes. There has been some discussion about the, the spinning case. The bottom line is that there is no um, uh, tidal effect beyond the tidal heating that I was mentioning before. So for, for spinning black holes in GR, what one would call conservative log numbers uh, are zero while they are not zero for exotic compact objects. Um, and therefore, this can be used to, 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 to distinguish uh, among the two models. Interesting enough, also for the tidal deformability, certain models of exotic compact objects have a tidal of number, in this case, logarithmically with epsilon. So this is, again, a blessing. Uh, let me just mention that here I discuss quadruple moment, tidal eating, uh, tidal deformability, all separate. But you can put everything together in a coherent in spiral wafer model. This was done in this paper here. Uh, and also, you can try to build in spiral waveform ring down models, toy models for exotic compact object. This was done in this other paper here. And the bottom line is that if you start putting information together coherently, uh, you might get much better constraints because, of course, you reduce your parameter space. And for example, here, what we were discussing is that just including one of these terms, tidal or quadruple corrections, one by one, gives you less good constraint, I mean, less stringent constraint than doing a coherent 5 pn waveform approximately the spiral. So this, in the future, for a given model, this is something that can be done more, more properly. So this is my uh, next to uh, last slide. Uh, just a few words on extreme maceration spirals. Uh, we didn't discuss them in the discussion session, but they are really interesting. I think that they are unique probes for both the multipolar structure and the dynamics of the theory. And for exotic compact objects, they are particularly interesting because um, all the effects I was mentioning before are amplified by the small mass ratio limit and by the number of cycles 
in, in Lisa band for extreme oscillation spirals. For example, constraints on the quadruple moment can be put at this level for the quadruple moment scalar. Uh, constraints on the reflectivity of the object can be put at the level of 10 to minus 4, which is really impressive. And this essentially tells you that a memory detection in LISA, if it puts such a constraint, it will automatically exclude the echoes in the post merger because with this reflectivity, there are no echoes. Um, and finally, even the tidal load numbers can be constrained by orders of magnitude better than for neutron stars in LIGO. So this is really uh, promising. On the other end, there are challenges for Emery's in the waveform model in parameter estimation, even the rates that are very unsure. So this is something to understand better, both for astrophysics and for test of gravity and for test of exotic compact objects, but it will be very, very uh, promising. So conclusions, uh, we are leaving the black hole era for sure. And uh, uh, we have the exciting opportunity to, to discover or to search for new physics. There has been dramatic improvement on uh, exotic compact objects on all fronts in the last few years, both phenomenological level, theoretical level, and uh, from, I mean, from what concerns observations and, and tests. And this, I think, is motivated by the fact that any signature of beyond careness will really shake physics on to its ground. So it's not an endless job. It would be something that it's important to, to, to do. And in fact, even though event horizons are conceptually impossible to prove, uh, to, to, prove to, yeah, to constrain, we can put better and better constraints on the reflectivity of this object, on the compactness, and some models have already, have already been rolled out by this observation, which is actually great. A last comment is that event horizons are very spatial, so they have very unique properties, and they might be a portal to observable quantum gravity effect. Uh, if this is going to be the case, we better uh, look for a fact that scales logarithmically with some macroscopic parameter that can be measured uh, in gravitational astronomy or with electromagnetic facilities. And fortunately, this is the case for many observable in this business. So, I mean, the situation is actually promising to put very strong concern. So let me thank you for the attention and I will uh, leave you with this uh, running the movie, the simulation that, that uh, Taishi Keda performed for, for our project. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. It was a very nice talk. It's nice to see how much work has been done in the last last years. I mean, a few years ago when this was all starting compared to now, that's, it's really impressive. So we have time for questions. Um, I, let me see, uh, Eugene first. Hi, Paolo. Thanks. That was a very nice talk. Um, I actually have a question about fastballs, right? So one of the things about fastball is that your, your, the idea is that you is kind of a sum of all different geometries. I mean, at least that's the, 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 as advertised on the tin. Um, so my question is that, so we, so if you have a black hole, then you have a, some sum of geometry. So in principle, you can calculate the entropy of that thing. And it, do people know, I do not know the answer because I'm not familiar with fastball, that what is the, the similar representation for something that is not quite a black hole yet, like something that is very, very compact, but not quite Schwarzschild compact. Do we also have a similar kind of sum over geometry description of that in the fastball picture? Uh, so, well, let me, a disclaimer, I'm not an expert either, um, but uh, so for what I can understand, the, the everything that depends on the dynamical properties is very preliminary in the sense that, for example, okay. the, the, the simulation that I was showing for a, a test scalar field are one of the first examples of uh, dynamical studies on, on FASO. So, so far, most of the studies have uh, concerned uh, stationary solutions. So stationary black holes, so there is an event horizon and trying to, uh, to attempt a microscopic description of it in a in certain in center framework. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah, because uh, the reason I asked the question is because one of the things that I was thinking about is whether or not we can understand the transition of very highly compact object to a black hole is in the sense to calculate what the entropy of the system as you transition, like to calculate whether or not it's a first order, second order phase transition mm -hmm. in its way. I mean, in, in, in standard boson star and black hole, I'm not quite sure how to calculate it because, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know what the entropy of the black hole is. Uh, uh, but in terms of the fastball, it seems that there's a possibility. So in a way that we can try to see whether or not the, the limit epsilon goes to zero is actually a, 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 a limit that you can take smoothly, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe to, to comment about uh, this. So one is that uh, related to the entropy, um, the exact 
uh, accounting for the entropy was possible only for very specific models and theories. Exactly, so yeah. In general, it's still an open problem, accounting yeah, okay. for, for the entire entropy. But even, say, uh, taking that apart, the an interesting question, I agree with you, would be, for example, if I take one of these uh, low energy effective field theory and I do a collapse of some, some field, exactly, yeah. do I end up with a black hole? Because black holes are still solutions in this theory. Exactly, yeah. or, do I, or do I find a regular solution? This is an interesting I, My guess is that it will depend on the initial data. Uh, but um, yeah, it's an open problem. Thanks. OK, time for one last question, uh, Alex. Yeah, hi, hi Paolo. Um, I also want to ask about these supergravity simulations. Um, you said that you're seeing something that looks like echoes coming out, and I just wanted to know if if the the rate at which the amplitude of the echoes is is falling off. Presumably, this is this is controlled by some feature in the supergravity theory. Is it is it clear what it is that is kind of controlling that that rate at which the yeah. echoes diminish? So it's much less clear than in, uh, in other models, so than in control settings. Um, of course, I mean, the only way the amplitude can go down is, at least within our framework, is gravitation wave emitted at infinity. The problem is that these geometries are essentially arise from uh, what is called multi-centers geometry. So there are charges located at some given points to, to, uh, to ensure that the solution is regular. And they have a certain geometry. So the gravitational potential has a shape such that it confines radiation in a, in, in a certain way. Um, and this, I think, matters a lot because, for example, in those simulations, we were starting with a spherical pulse, and then it becomes quadrupolar, for example. And by doing so, it's reflected off this effective potential in a particular way. So I guess that the, so the analog of reflection back and forth of the cavity here is much more complicated, and that is what regulates the time scales eventually. So yeah, the short answer is we don't know yet uh, our precise uh, parameters that govern this. Okay, I think that's it. We're we're done with your talk. Thanks again a lot for being here. Thank you very much. Then we come to the last speaker of of today, uh, Brando Bellazzini. Uh, are you here? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Okay. Perfect. Welcome. Um, Rando is a permanent researcher at the Paris uh, Saclay University and affiliated with CERN. And he is more talking about particle physics um, and the interface with gravity today. We're very happy that you're here. And uh, I will also give you a five minutes reminder for the end. Okay. Thanks. Let me share the screen. Can, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. And the also pointer as well? Yes, we can also see the Perfect. pointer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. First of all, it's a pleasure to speak at this workshop. And I apologize, I, I missed uh, basically the talk so far. Um, I will discuss about uh, um, basically universal uh, constraints. They come from properties, the fundamental properties of the S matrix of the underlying microscopy theory that's behind uh, any given effective theory. And I, I will uh, discuss uh, the implications of these universal constraints for the all Galileans. And uh, let me say that this is a, a basically mostly based on work done in collaboration with these fantastic people. Uh, Joan Elias Miró, Ricardo Rattazzi, Mark Rimbaud, and Francesco Rivo. So I want to discuss basically structural properties of effective theories. So when you flow at the uh, long distance limit uh, of a given theory, and I want to discuss properties like in some uh, robust uh, structural way. So we focus on observable quantities like asymmetric elements and characterize for the purpose of this talk, basically mostly, I will work most at 11. So my effective theory is characterized by a series of terms called width of coefficients, which are coefficient in energy expansion. And uh, uh, S is Mandelstam variable S for this, the center of mass energy of the scattering, T is momentum exchange square and so on. You can organize your uh, effective field theory amplitude in terms of, of powers in S and T. 
and is well known since basically the birth of quantum field theory that the, uh, the birth of your quantum field theory, that the, the effective field theories are constrained by symmetries that survive along the energy flow from the UV, from the microscopic scales to the la long distance scales. So for example, if you have a theory with a sheet symmetry, uh, the amplitude, this is reflecting the amplitude, the fact that this constant term here is missing. Okay, that's reflected by a property of the theory uh, that's reflecting the amplitude is reflecting some properties about the microscopic theory. And this is well known, okay? This, uh, we use symmetries all the time in particle physics to constrain uh, the long distance physics. But there are more, many more constraints in fact that apply to effective field theories that come from other things which are not symmetries. They come, as we will see, from unitarity of the asymmetrics and from, from locality, from causality. And most, uh, perhaps the, the, the most known is the positivity or some of these coefficients. For example, the, the, the first has been perhaps discovered um, some 15 years ago is a positivity of this guy here, C2, the coefficient of the Mandelstadt term S squared in the football linear. But what, what I show you is that this is just a tip of a big geom geometric uh, iceberg. I want to discuss uh, uh, what's the underlying geometric structure uh, uh, behind this. Uh, effective field theories and since this is a workshop in gravity to apply them to a theory of interest, which is a theory of Galileans. So this is just a tip of an ice, but if you go closer to the surface, you will see there are actually also inequalities involving parameters of different dimensions. So meaning that if you will ever measure one of the two, you will discover something about the cutoff of the theory. So that's very important. And if you go beneath the surface, in addition to linear relations like this one, you will see there are also nonlinear relations relating parameters again at different dimensions. There are many of them. In particular, we'll be concerned, so talking about Galileans, uh, about properties of this guy here, the coefficient of S squared times T. So let me stress that I don't care about any particular of these inequalities per se, but the goal of this talk is to show you was the underlying geometric picture, the structural properties the effective field theories have, and that they are universal, you can use uh, in, many, in many contexts. In doing so, we discuss how to get all the positive bounds, how to establish the optimal bounds out of them, and then the implications uh, for weakly broken Galileans. That's the plan of the talk. Let me say that this is, I consider this to be very important, because uh, there is a, a growing, growing body of evidence that uh, um, if you just, as a low energy observer, if you just write down effective field theories according to your Wilsonian perspective as a long distance observer, just writing whatever is possible based on the symmetry that you observe, the matter content that you have, you actually end up in a space which is much larger than the one that's given by the project of the RG evolution of a microscopic theory in the UV down a long distance. This is well known in, you know, in the string theory literature that it goes under the name of, of the swamp plant program or the landscape. But in fact, is um, is much more general than that. So it's, uh, it's not related to string theory per se. There are in fact plenty of effective field theories we will see that do not emit a UV completion as a quantum field theory. So regardless of gravity. Gravity will impose further constraints. And so the question which many people ask and try to answer is what are what distinguish the landscape, so the, the end point of the RG evolution along distance, from uh, basically a space of effective theory where they look consistent, but they don't come from any uh, uh, microscopic parent theory. So what, what this define this boundary here? And I will try to argue that using positivity of scattering amplitudes is, is one way to characterize such a boundary, at least provide uh, necessary conditions. Important that you have one message I want to give you in general is that not everything goes in effective field theories. There are many more constraints than just uh, uh, using symmetries and, and, uh, and power count. Okay, positivity. So this is basically. Uh, 
um, properties that come from uh, basically uh, things that we, we think are, are universal about S metrics, in particular for, so we focus in this talk to what's best known, which is two to two scattering amplitudes. And in, uh, so we discussed first the forward limit and then later also beyond the forward limit. And the key ingredient is gonna be analyticity. Okay, the scattering amplitude are uh, in the uh, fixed uh, Mandelstam variable T are analytic function in the center of mass energy squared S. Besides from the usual poles and branch cut that are associated to particle productions. And this is important, I think is really the key underlying ingredient because it connects UV physics and IR physics because you can calculate, you can draw a contour in the infrared of small energies, small s, and calculate things with your effective theory, your low energy. By construction, you match your calculation with effective field theory calculation. And then you can deform the contour and go exploring the UV. By analyticity, these, these two things have to match. And that's the UV IR connection comes from analyticity now. Now, a small contour like this, you do an integral or some quantity related to amplitudes will depend on which coefficient of the effective theory. Whereas if you deform the contour, you send it all the way to infinity, it will depend on things you don't know, like the UV completion, which is unknown. And because analytics, you can write an equal sign. So the left-hand side, this contour, integration along this contour is equal to something you don't know how to calculate in principle. Like, nevertheless, by, uh, uh, by unitarity, you know that the discontinuity along this branch cut by the optical theory must be positive. So even though you don't know how to calculate it, you're guaranteed that this quantity is positive. So you learn this by this uh, connection, UVIR, you learn that this quantity you calculate in the infrared as well has to be positive. Now, the first thing for which this integral makes sense is convergent is uh, uh, related to the coefficient of the S squared that I was mentioning at the very beginning. And that's why these people noticed that the coefficient of S squared term in effectively must always be positive. Okay, that's why. And this has been generalized, for example, in this paper uh, uh, to particles of arbitrary spin. In, in, and it's a fairly general statement. And, um, and beyond the formal limit also in, in this other paper. Let me show you an example, which I think is really paradigmatic and show you the power of this simple observation. So far, just basically a mathematical statement. And um, I wanna show you why it's important. So let's imagine that you have a T of a single Gaussian boson, some shift symmetry, pi goes to pi plus constant. You start as a effective field theory practitioner to write down all terms allowed by the symmetries. First term, with lowest number of degrees is the kinetic term, is allowed by the symmetry, perfect, is a theory of particles, is the most important operator of low energy, is the kinetic energy. So the theory is very well defined by something that propagates straight line, and then there are some interactions coming from eigenderivatives, which are gonna be suppressed by a small derivative expansion. Which is, what, what are these extra terms allowed by the symmetry? The next term is d pi to the fourth, with a coefficient which is not fixed by symmetry. C, positive, negative, or zero, respect the symmetry. However, if you look at this constraint and you calculate the scattering amplitude, pi pi and pi pi, the full limit, it picks up this coefficient, which must be positive. So there is no theory that will complete a theory with C negative, okay? That's an immediate consequence that you can derive from this setup. Now, this was, you know, super well-known, very established fact and there have been a lot of um, implications, in fact, in many areas of, of, uh, of theoretical physics. Uh, I wanna discuss some recent progress that have been done uh, by us and by other groups uh, that we'll mention later. By a simple observation is that what you're really calculating here is a moment of a distribution. You see, you have a, some positive yet unknown quantity, the imaginary part of the 2 to 2 scattering amplitude, which is known only in the, uh, the bottom of the infrared end of, your, of the spectrum, but is not known in the UV, unless you know the UV. 
presumptions that you, you, you the short distance physics is unknown. So you don't know this thing, but it's, you know it's positive. So it defines a positive measure that you are integrating against some polynomial in one, uh, in one over S to some power. So you're really calculating moments of a distribution, which is unknown yet is positive. So think about moment will, will be the basically key to, to extract many more information than just positivity of these terms. Let me sh show you an analogy why I think in terms of moments uh, is key here. Let's imagine just something that everybody's familiar perhaps. Let's take a star for which you don't know the energy density. So just, you know, it's a spherical star, the energy density is positive, but it's unknown, say. So, you know, you, can, you start calculating the moments of the star. You know that the mass, first moment, is positive because the energy density is positive. Second moment, again, the energy density is positive, little r here, the radius, the, the, the radial coordinate of the star is also positive. So, you get a moment in units of the radius of the star in the mass, which is also positive. And so on. All moments are positive. But clearly, you can say much more because little r here is smaller than capital R. So you immediately know that M1 is actually smaller than one. So not only has to be positive, it actually be bounded also above. And the same, M2, since little r here is, is smaller than capital R, M2 is actually smaller than M1. So you immediately see that there are infinitely many relations among the moments, and any moments is bounded above and below. So not just, it's not just statement about positivity that, uh, the quantity you're gonna calculate have to live in some positive region, but they are actually bounded in, in both directions. For example, this is in the M, M1, M2 plane, two moments in this example. You have to live actually in this region. This, this region here is not allowed just by positivity of the distribution. You can keep going, you've been trying to be smarter. You just integrate, so you, yeah, you were integrated, I guess, monomials, you can integrate a different function. Let's, see, let's try this one. Capital R minus little r squared, which is positive, integrated against positive measure is also positive. And because this choice, this clever choice of minus sign here is a non-trivial constraint. Again. This quantity is positive. And so it cuts also this part. So you see, even though I don't know anything about the energy density, except it's positive, I can tell that no matter, so any experiment will not put a point in this point here, this, this, uh, um, in this region or in this region, have to believe inside here. You can keep going, okay? You integrate your measure, but besides measure, that's what they want to do. They want to integrate measure against functions. Uh, they are functions, basically. And the, the clever choice of your test function, the more information you're gonna extract. So let's try now capital R minus little r cubed with a minus sign such you try to learn something more. Now, now you see the game seems to stop because it involves a new moment, M3. Whereas imagine you experimentally you access only M1, M2. You just have access only a few uh, information, or just the first two moments. But you can take uh, convex combinations, so linear combination with positive coefficients among inequalities with strata further bounds. For example, you can add M3, which you know also is positive from this argument, to this one to remove it. So this part is also positive. It gives a further constraint. And you can keep going, doing over and over again. And if you do it infinitely many times, you end up in this compact region. So there is no theory of stars that we put a moment everywhere else that, but in this uh, white region. And you see that you from linear relations, because you have infinitely many, you can recover some nonlinear uh, uh, boundary or where your uh, uh, measurements have to live. So the main lesson so far, this is just, again, this is a little bit, bit of a mathematical trickery, is that when you have a positive distribution and you want to extract what information uh, is associated with, this, uh, with uh, it's, uh, it's being positive, what you have to do is to stress it, to, to integrate it against some uh, function which is positive in its, in its support. And then it's always possible to project on a final subspace by taking convex combination. And if you have infinitely many conditions which are linear, they actually build up a nonlinear 
space of, of inequalities. Okay, this was just an analogy, okay, just to show you that it's a mathematical simple fact about moments. I want to show you that why it is important for effective filters. Okay. Let me first, so I was discussing a few moments for star. Now, here you define, so in the uh, S plane for the Mandelstam variable S, you look at the amplitude and you integrate this amplitude in a little contour here in the infrared. Okay, this, this quantity we call the arc is an infrared uh, representation of something you can calculate in the effective theory. Okay, something that's an infrared, so you can use the effective theory to calculate it. But because analyticity, it admits these UV representations. So it's an integral over a discontinuity, which is itself is positive because of unitarity. So it's exactly in the form up to a change of variables of a moment. Okay. And we just saw that the space of moments is in one to one correspondence with the space of positive function in the support of the, of the measure. So all the bounds in this quantity that you can calculate with the width of coefficient of the effective theory. Have to, so I'm going to satisfy, and you want to correspond with the space of functions that you can label in, 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 the, in the interval zero one. Well, that, so this again sounds like a little bit of abstract, but you see it's, it's very simple. So what's the space of function? Well, so any function that's uh, continuum in, the, in a compass space, you can expand it in polynomials. And and they converge uniformly. So you can basically swap integrals and series and the sum, summation sign. So you can just look at the basis of, of polynomials. And this is a convenient basis in this problem is the Bernstein polynomial because they themselves are positive in the interval. And the coefficient itself is also positive. So it means that any positive function on the interval can be written as a convex combination of Bernstein polynomials. So all the bounds are just integrating the measure against this monomial. That's it. This represents the whole bound that your theory is going to satisfy. Now, x times the measure is this quantity you can calculate with the width of coefficients. 1 minus x to the k is the discrete derivative of that. Okay? It's just, just taking difference or two different values of this quantity or this moment. So what, we are just, what I'm just saying is that giving a series of observables of this type, which will depend on which of coefficients, they come from a positive measure, in this case, from a positive, from a theory with a, with a, which is unitary, with a positive imaginary part of the amplitude, if and only if they satisfy the as of moment uh, theorem. That is, if they satisfy these inequalities. Okay, so this is very, uh, maybe abstract. Let me just write again some of these inequalities here. For example, the first is just saying that all these moments have to be positive. The second is just saying that they have to be monotonically decreasing. The second is a convexity statement, and so on and so forth. Why, why, why bother? Well, because this quantity we are calculating, these moments, are actually one-to-one -one correspondence with width of coefficients. So you take the amplitude at three level, is a in forward limit is a polynomial in the Mandelstam variable s divided by s to the 2n plus 3. This integral along this contour picks the residue. So for, for example, n equals 0, first moment picks c2. For n equal 1, picks c4. So all these bounds are actually bounds on all these coefficients. They are infinite in okay. Let me give you just, just the most immediate application is that just measure two of them consecutive, this inequality here is telling you that the ratio of them gives an upper bound on the cutoff. So just measuring two of them, you can tell that the theory has to break down before, before uh, this number here, okay? this, which is dimensionful because this is the coefficient of two terms with different powers in edge. And I want to stress now that this is way stronger way, way stronger than the constraint that come from um, perturbative unitarity. So we'll see in a second that theory that's per perfectly perturbative unitarity all the way up to plan scale actually phase this bound. So that's, uh, um, let me show you. Let's take, for example, uh, a theory of massive higher speeds. 
So you can imagine that you engineer the situation where at the bottom of the spectrum, you have a, part, a, mass, a massive particle with high spin, bigger than two. And you can ask, where is the cutoff for this theory? Now, of course, to, to, be treat, to, to be able to treat this problem, you have to assume there's a mass gap between the mass of this particle and the rest of the spectrum. So I'm assuming there is a separation scale. I want to see if I, I will find a contradiction or where up to which separation this system is consistent. And you can write an effective theory under this assumption. It has this form, okay? It's, uh, depending on whether the spin is uh, odd or even, and depending whether you're scattering longitudinal polarization associated to this like spin. In general, we grow very fast with energy. This is the uh, best. Can, can grow faster than this, but this is the lowest possible uh, growing with energy that it can have, is e to the 3j, where j is the spin of the particle for j even. But the coefficient overall actually can be very small, depends on the mass. So if the mass is very small, you can suppress um, the amplitude. So the strong cap is actually very far in units of the mass of the particle. So this seems a theory that's consistent with, uh, uh, with Sonian research. We have a theory at the bottom of the spectrum, is weakly coupled, the strong cap is very separated, seems okay. Well, oops. Okay, let me, so let me, uh, it's not okay, so, because from this argument here, just you take the ratio of two consecutive powers and you learn that the cutoff actually should be smaller than the mass, which is a contradiction that we had that effective in the first place. And it's completely irrelevant, you had a small coupling here, but you had a, the stroke of scale was very far. It's completely relevant because it drops, it drops in this fish. Now, this seems an exotic system. I, I get massive, I guess, spin at the bottom of the spectrum. But this explains, first of all, why no matter what you do, for example, in gauge theories, you can vary the number of spin, sorry, the number of flavors, the number of colors, the number of species. You never get at the bottom of the spectrum, like this particle to be an eigen spin particles. That's why, because it's inconsistent with your eternity. And, and moreover, so it's immediately telling you that all these Galileo-like theories of this type, where you have a scalar which enjoys a shift symmetry of this type, where you shift by some polynomial or a polynomial in, in the space-time, they are not going to be uh, uh, consistent because this basically represent the longitudinal polarization of such an p, for which we just saw that the cutoff must be right at the mass of, of, of this particle. So for example, let's take a theory like pi going to pi times a polynomial, um, very high order. So the invariant, scary time is invariant, of total derivative, if this is traceless, and then you can write in interaction terms with a lot of derivatives. And then you can imagine you have some small breaking effects of this symmetry, which are small by symmetries. Okay, this break a symmetry, this break a symmetry, this break a symmetry. So units of the cutoff, they should be small, okay, by symmetry reasoning. You calculate the amplitude, you're dominated by this term, because this respect the symmetry. This, this number here is large in units of the cutoff. So again, this is, should be larger than this. Well, but that's precisely in contradiction with, with these bounds. So basically, Galileo like symmetry of this type cannot work. Now, the Galileo is at the, where, at the edge in this, in this system because it gives an amplitude, it goes like STU. So they vanish when T equals zero. So this argument was so far at T equals zero. So it doesn't apply for actually the usual Galileo. It applies for all its generalization. But for the Galileo, it seems to escape. It's really at the, at the edge. So it seems to escape this argument. So I will, I will come back to that and show you a, vari a variant of this reasoning, how to include also the Galileo in this space of inconsistent theories. Before doing so, let me, however, uh, let, have a little, uh, another little detour. So, so, so far, I, so I, I mentioned that these were all bounds that come from uh, analyticity and unitarity and locality. I don't know this type. They are infinitely many, but they involve infinitely many Wilson coefficients of the effective theory. 
which some you may not access perhaps, okay? Because they are too small, because they don't have precision for many reasons. So you would like to project all this bound, the infinite many bound in a sub final subspace that you care. For some reason, you experimentally access only a few of them. How, how you can do it? Of course, you can take linear combinations with positive coefficients, complex combination, and do it by hand. But there is a much uh, efficient and uh, clever way. And before you were, we were integrating a measure against an arbitrary function on an interval. Now you want that this, this operation gives you only a finite number of width coefficients. So it's enough. What you have to do is to integrate it against an arbitrary polynomial of fixed order. The order given by the number of, of, of moments of width coefficient you, you care. So you fix the, num the order n. Yeah. And so the problem becomes uh, of classifying, oops, classifying all positive polynomials of fixed order. And this is also well, well known to mathematicians. A positive polynomial at an interval is just a, is a square. It could be a square of, a, of an arbitrary polynomial of half the order. It can be a square times a monomial x, which is positive between zero and one can be a, a square times one minus x, which is also positive, or can be a square times x, one minus x. And this exhausts all possibilities. So why, why it's important? Because, well, so this can, an arbitrary polynomial square means that if I shuffle this here, and take it against the measure, I get alpha i xi times alpha j xj. So it means for arbitrary alpha i alpha j, it means this ma ankle matrix, this matrix built of this, with the coefficients, must be positive definitely. That's the first condition coming from this, this guy here. This one, the same, just shifted by x by one, the width of coefficient in this matrix, that also must be positive definitely. Very similar for the other. That means that the optimal bound, bounds on a finite subset of width of coefficient you're gonna measure is given by these this, uh, uh, inequalities on the Ankel matrices. For example, okay, suppose you measure only three of them, you measure uh, the first three widths of coefficient in an amplitude. So in which space should they live? Well, you, you look at these conditions, they have to live in one shot, you get the space we were getting at the beginning with the star, with the analogy, with the astrophysics star, not doing one, one, one constraint at the time, taking a combination. In one shot, you can get uh, immediately the space allowed. You see that's compact. Okay? You cannot go, not only they have to be positive, but they have to live in this compact region. And there is, a, of course, generalization of any n for any number of uh, model, with the coefficients of the effective you can. You can keep increasing. You see, for example, for three, with the coefficient, you have to live in this uh, yellow and narrow region. Then once you project on a subspace, you recover this one. Okay? You project, for example, on two of them, I reproduce precisely this one by construction, right? because the optimal bound, after you marginalize over the unknown uh, with the coefficient, you don't care. And you see, it's very constraining, okay? Let me mention this, this bound has been derived also uh, by Kahneman and uh, Wang and Wang. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, um, basically, in the limit, when you take all bounds again, so when you send the, the order of the polynomial to infinity, you include all with the coefficient. In fact, just the first two are enough because one minus x is itself a square of a polynomial. When you allow the polynomial to be of infinite order, it's the square of the square root of one minus x expanded. And so these two conditions are, are, are enough in the, in the end going to infinity. So, as I mentioned, these are implications for Galileo-like theories, but the actual Galileo that we people usually care, the one that emerges, for example, as the longitudinal mode in massive gravity, that is escaped so far the analysis because uh, it vanishes its amplitude in the formal limit. So we have to, to, to catch it, or to say something about it, you have to go beyond formal. And there are, Basically, various way to do so. So you wanna basically say something about this term. This term are suppressed for Galileans by the Galilean shift, shift symmetry. These are not. 
So we want to capture and say something about those. How, how you can do it. But first of all, they run inside loops. So in fact, they renormalize, uh, they enter in the normalization of other, for example, C6 or other operators that do not vanish in the for limit. For example, the normalization of C6, in fact, using just this simple fact that uh, they, you can, because when you run, basically when you, when you calculate a loop, you are summing over all intermediate states, they are not necessarily in the forward limit. So summing over all climatical configuration. For example, you cut the diagram and look at the dimensional part, you sum over all possible configuration. So you're sensitive also to beyond forward uh, limit couplings. And that's immediately you get an upper bound on this coupling in units of, of for example, C4 or C2. So breaking, Galilean breaking couplings. So they cannot be too large. This was already known uh, since this point. Uh, you have five minutes left. Okay. And you can use crossing symmetry to say more. For example, in, in a scalar theory with a single flavor, there's only a single operator you can write down at uh, dimension uh, A, at dimension uh, S to the four, which is this one. So C to two, the coefficient of T squared S squared is related by just uh, com combinatorics to the coefficient of C four, the coefficient of S to the four by a factor of three. Since C4 was bounded by C2, C22 is also bounded. So you can just immediate application. But you can do much better. Okay? You can do much better. You can do a partial wave decomposition and study what, what a, 2D, a 2D moment problem. And this is what we did. Um, we you consider now an arc, a finite T. And now, before the arcs were in one to one correspondence with moments. And so putting constraints on moments was the same as putting constraints on width of coefficients. Now it's a little bit more complicated. What you get is that the arcs of finite t are in correspondence to a linear combination with a finite number of moments. Okay? And these moments are moments of a two-dimensional distribution, one in the energy, called x here, and one in the angular moment, total angular moment of j squared. And very important difference mathematically is that the distribution in G squared is non-compact. Angular momentum can take infinite values from zero to infinity and discrete values. So for example, the first moment, the coefficient S squared at finite T is not just C2, but it also involves C21. And you can write in terms of moments of this distribution. Now you see, now it's more complicated to start information C21 because there's a minus sign here. So you cannot conclude, for example, C21 is positive. There's a minus sign here. Nevertheless, you can conclude things because mu one zero is bounded. It cannot be too large, it's bounded by mu zero zero. So this one cannot too, be too negative either, okay? So bounding with the coefficient of finite is the same as solving the two moment problem in the product of a compass space, the one for energy times the one from the angular moment. This is much harder problem analytically because uh, the space of uh, associated to the angular moment is non compact and discrete. In particular, polynomials can now be negative between two consecutive values of the angular momentum. And that's consistent because when integrated against this measure, which has support at discrete points, the negative part uh, doesn't pick up any contribution. So if you basically write a table with these all moments in, in J squared, the angular momentum, in the energy, you can uh, study a single one moment problem at a time. Every row here is a moment problem. Every, every column is a normal problem. And doing so, you can get a uh, various bound that we draw here. For example, constraining precisely C21 over C2. So with the, the Galilean term over the Galilean breaking uh, term C2. For example, this bound here, C21 uh, is smaller than, um, has to be bigger, you have to be above this dashed line, was discovered in this paper here. It's just the statement that was saying that this term cannot be too negative. It's bound by um, mu zero zero, this one is positive, so this at most can be minus three half is this bound. And then, but you see, you can get better bounds here as a lower, and you can get upper bound from, from, from the loop. So you see C21 over C2 cannot actually be very large, even though C2 preserve a symmetry and C2 breaks. But you can do way better than this, okay? This is just um, basically 
tip again of, um, an iceberg because the two deep memory problem is not just collection of one deep memory problems one at a time. So it's, it's much more richer. It's much richer than that. However, it's actually much harder to solve, okay? And the reason is because the space on angular momentum is non-compact and discrete. So we can do a simplification. We can remove some information. For example, I can say, I can forget that the angular momentum was support on discrete points. I'm going to take it against a measure in the angular momentum without requiring the support at discrete points. So this means that my bounds are not gonna be, sorry, they're not gonna be optimal, but they're gonna be rigorous. So you have to write basically a polynomial in, uh, in J square angular momentum in energy X, which is positive. The, you can classify the structure of this polynomial and you will integrate it against the measure, you will get this anchor matrices. Now in these two variable, angular momentum and energy has to be positive definite. And if you use information from cross symmetry, you immediately uh, uh, learn that C21 is actually bounded below and above by, uh, by this quantity. You can, this is completely analytic. There's nothing, uh, no numerics involved. It's a, it's a rigorous statement. It's not optimal, however, because I'm not using the whole information. Moreover, uh, well, and let me say that this is basically the end of Trinidad Galinus, okay? Because uh, you want uh, C21 to be, uh, be actually much larger than C2, okay? To have the symmetry in the first place. Instead, it can be at most a factor of few between each other. If you include, um, if you include uh, more information about the spectrums and the angular momentum is discrete, you can extract finer, more accurate bounds, for example, not just 6.5, but actually the optimal bound is actually 5.3, okay, something better. Doesn't, doesn't matter for, for ruling out the Galileo, but you can I just show you that you can do uh, things uh, better. And this was done, for example, in, this, in these two nice papers. Okay, so here are, uh, are my conclusions. Um, basically, the effective field theories live in this geometric object. Okay, so it's not that they satisfy only requirement by symmetry. In fact, we saw in the case of Galileans, the symmetries are in contradiction with the properties associated with the unitarity and causality. And the theory behind the structure of, uh, of amplitudes in the, in the low energy is the theory of moments of distribution. If you organize your width coefficient in powers of T and S, basically everything is read here, cannot, can never dominate the amplitude. C0, the first term is unconstrained. It's consistent to remove it by symmetries. C2 is unconstrained inside, but it has to be positive. In C21, we just saw that at least with this uh, uh, T-level T -level argument, is bounded uh, by, by C2. And, and basically, again, I'll say that this is, uh, makes uh, uh, clear that the Galilean symmetry is incompatible with these properties of, of, uh, of the amp. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot for the talk. So it's time for questions. Can just speak up or raise your hand. Okay, uh, Mario, the first. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk, Brando. Hi, Mario. I have, I have one general question actually uh, about positivity bounds. Uh, what will happen if instead of uh, having a um, relativistic theory, I have a, th a theory which violates boots invariance? I don't know, for example, a pion without a boost invariance in which you can cons construct terms with time derivatives and space derivatives separately. Um, so, yeah, okay, very well. So, so certainly you, so I think, uh, yeah, okay. So what, what's happening is that you are losing um, one of the handle of, uh, of Lorentz symmetry, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, manifest in the amplitude as crossing symmetry. So crossing symmetry becomes more, becomes trickier to, to, be, to be enforced. In fact, uh, in fact, if you have a theory which is not Lorentz, but suppose you have a theory which is uh, invariant of the, Galil the Galileo group, mm -hmm. for example, you don't even have the antiparticles. So yeah, you don't cross to, 
you, you don't even cross particles to antiparticles. This is an operation that's now before Dirac, nobody was dreaming about antiparticles. So the fact you have the Lorentz group is very important. Now you can imagine breaking the Lorentz group, Lorentz group spontaneously. Now, if you do so, so you keep the you keep the boost, but they act non-trivially on the vacuum. So they connect amplitude with different number of particles. For example, basically they add Gorston, soft Gorsons to the amplitude. I'm not sure how you can drive bounds. So I remember there's a paper by a very nice paper by Melvin recently about it, but I'm personally not convinced of I'm, 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 asking, I'm asking because I used to think that in the moment that you lose the boost invariance and you lose crossing symmetry, as you were mentioning, then you are completely doomed. But now from this point of view of um, that your bounds actually depends on properties of positive functions, it looks like it should be possible to, to generalize this result to, to well, this. Well, the point is that um, this, when, when I write it as a positive function, because I use the already cross mm -hmm. yeah. So I, 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 I related the, the discontinuity in the S channel, which is physical, from physical process, and positive energy. So it's positive necessarily by neutrality. But there's also a contribution from the negative, uh, from the, sorry, from the U channel, which is for unphysical energies, negative energy squared, which gives a positive contribution because of crossing. But if you don't know, if you don't use crossing, you cannot conclude that you're integrating a function against a positive measure. I think you can, as in this paper by Melville and another author, which unfortunately I don't remember his name, um, under certain assumption, you, 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 you can still use, you can still derive positive rebounds. But I want to say that I think they missed some of the assumptions. That in the yeah, but I, think, I think the reason, the reason why the Melville's work uh, works is because actually they are, they are breaking boost invariance, but by considering particles with different speeds. So actually they have a lot, a lot of symmetry and resolvents a lot the relativistic case. So uh, if you go to, a, let's say, more general Lorentz violating theory, and I'm not sure what they do actually applies to. Okay, thanks for your for your answer. Of course, of course you you may not even have the the U channel branch yeah. in there if you break Lorentz, so probably may not even arise. So you can perhaps still put positivity bounds. Yeah. Okay, uh, Matthew. Uh, thanks, Brando. So <clears throat> it's kind of related to the last question, which I I do think is an interesting. Uh, yeah, th those are interesting bounds you know, interesting to consider how the, how, if there any bounds could be constructed there, but um, maybe, um, yeah, related is how, how would these bounds apply, for example, on cosmological backgrounds or um, how, how do you think they can be extended or, or considered in, in the case of cosmological backgrounds? Yeah. I mean, this, 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 this of course, is very important for neurology. I don't want to say this good. Um, and, and it was motivation for this work by man. I think, I think um, so uh, at face value, you cannot extract, uh, I think, uh, the lessons from flat spay Minkowski to a cosmological background. Like just simple-minded answer would be this. Of course, I mean, the, the, the cosmological background is a solution of equations, which if I meet also, Flat space limit, you can you know run a Gedanken experiment and run the argument in those solutions, in the flat space solutions. And those apply to the same Hamilton. So Hamilton is one, solutions are many, cosmological background, flat space, the earth, the moon that goes around the earth, many, many realizations of the same dynamics. Right. You put yourself in one for which you can study information, and that's the information is for, for the for, for the uh, will apply also to other situations. There are caveats to, 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 to this point of view, however, because sometimes the value, sometimes you work in a fatty theory um, the, by, by construction was obtained by expanding around a given background. It's not that you had a theory like, uh, say, like general activity in the vacuum, you add matter and then you look at solution, but you can remove matter and still look at other solutions. Sometimes, for example, if you have a cosmological constant, it's not obvious that you can remove it. No, it's right, something right. that permeates space everywhere. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so 
is not um, uh, but for example, in models of inter energy models, where you imagine that the acceleration of the universe is driven actually by a field, and you can imagine that field that means other solution, including flat space limit, then you're in business. You can put, you can apply the bound. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. I don't see any other question. Okay, Marco has now just raised the hand. Marco, please go ahead. So, hi, Brando. Thanks Hello, for Marco. your talk. It was great. And uh, so it seems very powerful what, what you did. So let me just be sure that I, I, I well understood. So you were saying that basically there is no bound on the coefficients, but all the Galileans are in the swamp land. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so there, there, there is a caveat here, which clearly I glossed over. And uh, um, so there are some important infrared defects, which uh, So, there are, so these are massless particles, or when the mass is more, very small, uh, you have infrared divergences, or even if they're massive, you have large effects from large logs, and those may change the conclusion, okay? We are under investigation of this, so whether infrared logs could change the story. The short answer, so like, I mean, if you ask me this like uh, 10 days ago, I would, I would have told you, uh, yes, they changed the answer. The Galileo are still alive. <laughs> but in these last 10 days, I changed my mind with more evidence from, uh, so I think IR loops are actually under control if you do the calculation properly. So basically, and, uh, the, the softest so, behavior that you can have is P of X. With self the, oh, P of X is perfect, is an example of perfectly fine theory. No, exactly. So, but is, 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 the, is, is the only one left from, from what you're saying? So, the, the softest behavior that you can have is a derivative self interaction only of the P of X kind. Well, so again, I mean, P of X is so, uh, so the, the theory that we survive lives inside the P of X uh, yeah. parameter yeah. space. With the right. but it's not enough. It's not enough. You see. All these coefficients that you yeah. see, they have to be monotonic, convex. They're all, I mean, the infinite many constraints on those. Yeah. Still, but even with the P of X theory, you see the, this plot I had at the beginning uh, here, for example. It, it, you have to leave, for example, for two, the parameter you have to leave inside here. A point here is not allowed, even in P of X theory. No, but still, there is an island. In, in Galileans, there is, an there is, island, yeah. in Galileans there, there is not. Yeah, there is not. Oh, thanks. Okay, one final question, uh, Anna. Uh, hello, um, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Thanks. Um, uh, my question is uh, uh, again on Galileon and uh, constraints on this. Uh, could Galileon be saved by inclusion of gravity? Was it studied uh, like a model uh, with Galileon, which is minimally coupled to gravity? No, I don't think I don't think can be saved by gravity, including gravitons effect. Because you see, the important the Galileo, the important thing about Galileans is that you want to keep the lambda three scale finite when you send M Planck to be very large. So uh, that's precisely the limit I, I'm working in, in, in this talk. So you want to have the nonlinear structure of Galileans to, to have the Weinstein screen, for example, to survive even when M Planck is taking very large, which is the limit I'm taking here. So no, I don't think I don't think I think gravity basically is completely or, or, or said differently. If you are the consistency of your theory has to rely on the inclusions of, gra of gravity, <laughs> I mean that then uh, I mean the, I mean for which you know you don't even have the UV completion in the first place. I don't, I don't think it would be very, very, very good septic point. Uh, well, uh, the question was mostly about infrared effects, which could uh, do something uh, like poles, logarithms in T, which would appear if you consider gravity. Yeah. So I was saying, I was saying loops, loops that give a large logarithm. At the moment, I'm, I, I cannot. Uh, so I have uh, some preliminary evidence that uh, infrared logs 
do not spoil the results, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, it's still working progress. So I cannot tell you. Uh, the intuition, the intuition comes from the fact that so the, the, the inference singularity comes from the having um, so when you have mo small momentum exchange, the the you're basically scattering parts of a large impact, a large angular momentum or large parameter impact parameter, but you can reformulate all these bounds in the impact parameter, have have a cutoff in the impact parameter. And it seems the it seems uh, that the bounds survive. So I think I think there is evidence for that, uh, including infrared logs, uh, will not will not change the result. I'm I'm not I'm not hundred percent so sure. That that's true. But um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay. I think that's it. Um, and let me thank you again, Randall, for this talk and for being here for the questions. And of mm -hmm. course, all the speakers of today. Uh, that's the end of the fifth day. Tomorrow is the final day. We continue at the same time as usual. Uh, have a nice evening, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>